Hello and good morning and welcome to day four of the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. We are coming to you from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we're hosted live here and broadcasting around the globe. And uh, today I want to say that we are in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the capital city uh, of Manitoba in Canada. And we dwell on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Diné people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Here in Manitoba, we are considered one of the farthest and largest countries, um, pardon me, uh, cities in Winnipeg that's uh, this cold. So it's already snow here. And uh, we, we saw some snow flurries started um, a couple of weeks ago and then it stopped. And now we, have, we had some yesterday. And um, as, we, as we go through here, we just remember, remind us that we are not alone. We have uh, people all over the world who are working towards that. So my name is Joyce Adelison and I'm founder of the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. And I want to welcome you to day three, uh, uh, day four <laughs> of the summit. Let me give you a recap of our 2020 uh, virtual Global Workplace Wellness Summit. So we started off uh, planning this summit uh, last fall, uh, looking at you know, our vision, what we're going to do, uh, where we're going to be, and what the summit is going to look like. And in our plans, we had uh, seen ourselves at the College of San Mateo, which is where we, we partner with them to do the summit at live. And then we had all the plans set out, we had everything in place. And then we noticed um, COVID-19 came on actually in early March. And we thought, oh, well, this may not last. So let's just go ahead with our plans and see what happens. And of course, uh, we, will, we will, you know, regroup. And so we paused and waited and paused and waited. And as we waited, it became clearer that COVID-19 was going to be with us for most of 2020 which included the November 10th to 13th dates that we had for the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. So as a result, we decided to um, go virtual and live in Winnipeg and broadcast to the world. And our goal was to have a facility in Winnipeg and have a small number of individuals uh, with us. So we thought we would have probably uh, 50 to 100 people in the audience live and broadcast uh, globally. And then the numbers started decreasing how much we could have. And, you know, just this August, I was actually at a conference here in Winnipeg and there were uh, 50 people in the audience and people were um, social distancing and wearing masks. And I thought, wow, this is great. Uh, we can do, we can do it. And as the months wore on, uh, it seemed like that wasn't going to happen. And gradually, gradually, the numbers crept down until even yesterday, uh, we are actually completely locked down here in Manitoba because of the spread of the virus and how rapidly it's uh, getting through the community. So as a result, we are... Um, I'm on location filming uh, this and uh, sharing it, and all of the participants are virtual. So that just shows you how things change, and it changes in our work, and it changes in our life. But we do have to manage those changes when they come, and we do have to learn how to pivot and how to deal with those uh, changes that we're required to make, um, really, uh, emotionally and uh, mentally deal with that. So we decided to take a look at our agenda for the summit and to say, okay, based on what's happening, what do we need to cover? Because our, the theme of the summit this year is changing mindsets and building competencies for wellness. 
And as we looked at that word, changing mindset, how do we need to change mindset? And as we look at the, the thought of um, building competencies, how do we build competencies? And we started going and reflecting and looking on how and what we can do. And this is when we started to look around and see that we are having the, the greatest uh, social unrest that in my time, my lifetime, and the global health pandemic. And we also have uh, issues with our climate and economy. So what are the challenges? What do we need to do? How do we address these situations? And how can how are those issues showing up in the workplace? And that's why we switched our agenda so that we could have a place for people to come and talk about how these issues are impacting us at work, how these issues are becoming a challenge for us at work. And this is why we have actually done the agenda the way we did, because we wanted to give you more opportunities to discuss how am I being impacted at work? How am I, how, how is my life being impacted at work? How are these situations impacting my work life? Join the meeting. And this is what we've been doing with our agenda. So on day one, we started with looking at eradicating systemic racism because of the social unrest, because we were seeing so many people all around the world were concerned about racial injustice in the work, uh, in their lives and in their communities, we asked, is, does it happen in the workplace? And we started seeing many examples of it in the workplace. And so on day one, we had an amazing panel uh, of people from racialized groups sharing their experiences. But most importantly, we didn't want it to be uh, a session where we cried about our woes and we just talk about how difficult our lives are. We wanted it to be a session of hope. We wanted it to be, it was a working session. It was a round table. And it was supposed to be us looking at ways we can deal with the situation, looking at ways we can make changes, looking at ways we can do things to eradicate systemic racism at work. And that's what we did. We, we spent the day from eight to 3.30 and from 10 a.m. to 3.30 central time. And we, we had two discussions, two presentations, and then two panelist groups. And we went through the process of identifying what are the challenges and how do we solve them. Then we went on to day two and we look at how do we address the mental health crisis? Because not only were we in a mental health crisis prior to COVID-19, but we've come to realize that the stresses of COVID-19, the physical and social distancing, the uh, many of the challenges have resulted in additional stress and wear and tear on people's mental health. So due to the mental health challenges, we focused the entire day on day two on mental health. And we had some amazing speakers who shared with us, who came in and helped us to learn about mental health, learn about what we can do to address the mental health issues in our society. And you know, as we go through, we are be beginning to realize that mental health is a challenge in our community and in our workplaces more so than we realize or we actually have taken notes of. So as a result of that, we put together a really great panel and a roster of speakers and we had the fireside chat and a lot of tips and to tools and ideas on how to address systemic racism in the workplace how to address it, how to uh, eradicate it. And the thing that came out of that was what we can do individually to deal with systemic racism and how we can build our own selves up for that. In addition to that, we looked at uh, on day, day three, we went into what's happening in the workplace. How is wellness being seen? How is it brought on? 
how employees respond into wellness programs in the workplace, and, and why do we have such a high rate of um, non-attendance or non-participation in workplace wellness programs in the workplace. And so we started uncovering many of the trials and challenges. Uh, we explored different ways to engage employees and to get them involved and to get them into the planning and the actually creation of the workplace wellness program. And that went over really well. There were many, many great speakers and many great uh, pieces that we that we we learned about and so as we go through those days it's very important to look at the theme that came out overall the theme that came up over and over for us is that we need to shift our mindset wellness is not something that's static wellness is dynamic and every day we are going to encounter situations in life that will rob us of our wellness or challenge our ability to stay well. And it does come back to the mindset, the mindset we hold, uh, the, the mindset, the things we focus on and the things we do. And, you know, I've been getting calls and I, I've been invited to, um, to speak on the TV, a, a TV as a guest speaker on the TV show uh, next week. And they were asking, well, you know, uh, there is a lot of people who, uh, what are some things people can do to deal with the pandemic? And I said, I don't wanna talk about things people can do for the pandemic because everybody knows what they can do. The reality is what is makes sense for people to do, right? Join now, the meeting. It's not about what I should do. I'm not going to come on and just talk about, oh, you should take a break or you should uh, stretch. Or you, he said, that's, that's not where people are at. And we're going to actually focus on why people may not be doing the things that we expect them to do. Uh, what's in the way and how to remove the things in the way from doing. Because I think at this point, all of us have heard that in order to be successful remotely and to work remotely, we have to change certain things and change the different habits, but it takes a mindset. Until we change our mindset, those things doesn't happen. So it's important for us to change our mindset. And then once we change our mindset, it will be easier for us to do the things that we know that will foster wellness. So exciting, exciting to have you here. We're going to invite you, welcome, welcome, to just tell us where you, you're uh, joining us from in the summit. We've had people from different parts of the world. We've had people from uh, Europe. We've had people from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, the United States. Uh, we've had people from Ireland. We've had people from Asia. We've had people from Pakistan. So where are you joining us from? for the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. And people come in at different times to see different speakers. And we've had amazing speakers. I am blown away at the depth of research that our speakers have done for presenting at the summit, the work they've put into their presentation. It has been, I have been so, 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 uh, blessed and and I think it's it's a real blessing and a, a real honor that our speakers have put so much effort into their presentations and I cannot pick one presentation that I would edit or change something to or uh, the speakers have all been fabulous if you've missed any of the days of the summit then please do go ahead and look at look at the uh the YouTube channel, if you go to the website on the Global Workplace Wellness Summit on the homepage, you will always get access to one or two of the recordings. Uh, right now, I think for the next couple of days, we are allowing people to uh, view the entire summit in our YouTube channel. The summit is being broadcasted to the YouTube channel, the uh, Global Workplace Wellness Summit YouTube channel and you will be able to view. There are other ways you can get access to the recordings. We do have the Summit Marketplace. And in the Summit Marketplace, you can purchase 
uh, a pass and the VIP passes are in the summit and they're very, very reasonable. I think they're $75 or something like that. It really doesn't even cover the cost of us getting our, uh, our video person to um, edit and put them together. Uh, it barely does. Um, actually, no, it doesn't cover the cost. And so, uh, and if you want the entire summit, uh, then I think it's $199 for the entire summit. Uh, VIP pass. So you can go ahead and pick a day that you really wanted. If you're looking for tools and resources on mental health, then pick up the summit pass for day two uh, of the summit. The recordings, the speakers, the presentations, the tools and resources are amazing. And then if you're looking for uh, information on workplace wellness, so if you have a workplace a wellness program, or you're looking to create a workplace wellness program, then it's important for you to uh, be able to get the pass for day three. This is where you will be able to see some of the tools and resources, some of the different ways to engage employees in workplace wellness program, how to interact with them and help them to be able to participate and start from the groundwork by, by starting to create your program with the interaction, with the engagement, with the participation of your employees. And then from there, you will find that you will have more participation in your program. And today on day four, wow, we have a very, very full day. And um, we are going to, we're really going to have a fabulous day because our speakers for today are phenomenal. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Joseph Maroon, is here and I'm just making you co-host. So please accept and uh, so you'll be able to share your screen. And uh, we are going to start off with his presentation and he'll be sharing with us a little bit on his, on his book recently published and be sharing his story. I will be reading his bio uh, in a few minutes as before he gets started so you can get more. Then we're going to be joined by Patience Hemingway. Patience has been our energy, um, our energy boost uh, breath specialist for the summit and so she was with us um, all through the days. Uh, she was here day two, day three and she'll be here day four. She's going to lead us into some breathing exercise. These are great exercises that you can do at your desk. These are things that you can do um, at your table. You can do them standing up. You can do them sitting at your desk. Even if you're in just a cubicle and you don't have the ability to um, do, uh, you know, get up and you don't have a lot of room, you can do some of these stretches and breathe because it helps us to uh, connect what we do and remember that breath is so important to what we do and to live well. Then we're going to follow up with a presentation by Renee Moorefield. And Renee is going to be sharing uh, about the complexity of our society right now with COVID-19, our workplaces and the role of leadership. It's very, very important because this week um, we've covered so many topics, but today specifically we're looking at leadership, we're looking at resilience and self-care. So the speakers on the roster this today are going to be focusing on that. And then at 10.30, we're going to be um, followed with Anna Billion. And Anna is going to talk about um, how we can uh, retrain our brain. And uh, then we are going to have a lunch break and then we will have Yunus and Bolson. And Yunus is going to be talking about the power of ethical leadership. And we know that leadership is key. I think one of the presentations that we had yesterday, I was talking about the importance of leadership and how important it is to have good leadership in our organizations and how those, that leadership can help us with the things that we need to do in our workplaces so that we can actually be successful without the right leadership it's not we're not able to do the things that we uh, were supposed to do 
we're not able to get the, the tools and resources that we need. We, don't, we won't be able to get the funding. There are just so many things that we can have without lead, proper leadership. So it's imperative that we, uh, we have that leadership and that leadership supports us in moving, uh, moving our society and our workplaces around so that we can get the resources we need in place. And then we have uh, my um, John Ayo, who is going to be joining us at around 1.30. He'll be a speaker and he'll be speaking on travel, uh, travel health, and helping us to understand some of the key issues in that area right now and what's being done. Because all of us would like to travel again one day, but how do we do that and how do we do that well? Then, of course, we have Michael Levitz. He is our chief burnout expert, and he will be joining us in the afternoon at around 2.45. He'll be presenting. And then we have Fernando Flores, uh, who will be presenting on emotional uh, intelligence and, and well-being and really helping us to understand and connect the, the, the dots along emotional intelligence and well-being. And then we are going to have our last session uh, by John Toomey. And John is coming to us from Australia. And uh, so he's at the end of the day. And he's going to be talking about engaging men in blue collar. So one of the things that um, John had noticed in his work, uh, he speaks to how do we speak to males? And why do we need to speak to males differently? And how does that make a difference in our work? So that will be coming up later this evening. And uh, overall, uh, we have a very packed agenda today. And today is our final day. It has been quite a journey. And every speaker so far has been phenomenal, has presented uh, great research, great learning that has helped us to all of us to be uh, better at what we do, to be uh, leave here a little bit more intelligent with a little bit more determination on how we're going to maintain wellness at work, but also for ourselves. Because I think one of the underlying theme in what we got, what we learn is that we can go to work and the workplace is actually going to have a culture that's built by the people and the choices that we make. That's what creates the culture at work. It's the norms that work, the, the way we behave, the way we treat each other, the way we engage with each other. And that, of course, does reverberate down into our customer experiences and how they experience us in the workplace. So it's important for us to build healthy workplaces because it does impact the bottom line. And that's key. But critically to that is the ability for us to develop ourselves as individuals to develop our well-being, to develop our mind, to build our resilience so we can be successful and we can bring some positive energy into, into the workplace. And one of the things I was talking about yesterday is that those, those social vibrations that we bring into our work, that we that positive energy we bring and how that's really important to build us back into what we do. So at this time, we're going to uh, get ready for our next presentation. So we're going to uh, run through a bit of a, a commercial, and then we are going to get into our keynote presentation. So hang tight, and we will, we will be starting right at 8.30. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Dr. Maroon. Hello. Hi, Dr. Maroon. How are you? Good morning. Is that Joyce? It is Joyce. I see you're here and you're all set up. So Good, let's Joyce. let's take a look at your let's take a look at your um your, your PowerPoint slides. Do you need some help to get that going? Yes, I do. Okay. So you will see a little green button on the screen there. Share That's screen. Full screen. Click that. Good. And go to. Uh, 
uh, go to the slide on your on your computer that you want to share. So these are the, so upload my slides now. Upload, no, you just wanna share, just click on it and it will- Fred, do I click on desktop? Uh, when you go on your desktop, what are you seeing? I see a picture of you and it says desktop one. Oh, okay, you need to minimize your screen. Well, let me just, should, should I hit my slides now? Yeah, hit your slides. Okay, now my slides are up. Okay, did you press share at the bottom, share. that blue little- Share, yep. Okay, which slide do you wanna see? Okay, so you are not in presentation mode. So uh, you see on your screen there where it says, um, let me see presentation mode. Wait okay. a minute, I wanna make sure I have the right slides. I don't oh. have the right slides, shoot. shoot. Okay. <laughs> um, Just a minute. Okay, so once you get the right slide, you will click slideshow. Okay, now I have the right slide. Okay, go up there and click slideshow. It slide says slide. you slide are slide. sharing, screen you, sharing. You are sharing, don't worry. Don't worry about this sharing. Just go, you see where it says slideshow on your screen at the top there above your slide? It says home, insert, draw, design, transition. Go from view, you're on view now. Go back down, go back down, no. Nope. You're in view here. Okay, go across to your left. Slideshow, go and click on that. Click on slideshow. It says you're screen sharing. I don't see slideshow. Oh, your mouse. Oh, okay. Um, okay, click on the first slide on your on your presentation. Just double click. And um, if you go up, over your 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 thing there on your you will see slideshow uh, on your on your PowerPoint your first oh yes 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 I see it okay slideshow okay. no go back down underneath it to the left is another slideshow uh, menu uh, uh, on the menu bar for the PowerPoint. You're almost there. Go now. Take your take your cursor off there, just to the left. To so go to your left now, down off that bar, off that bar, the next bar below. It's right there. I'm seeing it. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, honey. I don't see it. No, says that's okay. You you see that orange bar for the uh for the PowerPoint? PowerPoint, yeah. Yeah, okay, so go down to slideshow right here. I, I, see, I see PowerPoint, quit PowerPoint, high PowerPoint, preferences. Okay, so move off that bar and go up to the next bar above it. The menu for your PowerPoint. No, take your cursor completely off, go on your slide. Put your cursor on your slide and click that. Okay, now... No, I can. You see on your PowerPoint, it says home. Can you see home? PowerPoint, it says home. No, I okay. don't. Okay, next to it, it said insert. Yes, yes, next yes. Next to it, it says draw. Yeah. Next to it, it says design. Right, right. Next to it, it says oh, okay. And that's slideshow. That's slideshow. That's what you want. Aha. Uh -huh. Click it again. Click it again. Go back to slideshow above there, yeah? The, the same one we just clicked before. Move your cursor back to slideshow and click slideshow. Okay, so now go, no, no, stay there. I'll go back over, oh, why? No, click it and then move your cursor off it. Click it again. Click it? Yeah. Okay, good. Move your cursor off it. Don't press anything right now. No, okay. go over back to home. And you see where you say play from start? Yes. On the home, click yes. that. Ah, now you're in business. Okay. <laughs> That's it. And you just click the next one and it will come up. <laughs> okay, I, I hate this. Oh, I, don't worry, you're I'm doing okay. fine. You're okay. doing okay. fine. <laughs> so you can hear me well. 
we can hear you and we can see your screen. And I'm going to introduce you and you're going to be up. Okay. Okay, yeah, let me do one thing. I want to see, make sure my slides advance. Okay. It's advancing, it's advancing. Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. Are you at the beginning now? Yes. Okay, all right. So I'm going to introduce you and we're going to get started. I always, I always like um, these, uh, these um, making sure everything. So good morning, okay. everyone. I'm, yeah, I'm with you, dear. You can tell that. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. And I want to just take this time to introduce our keynote presenter for this morning. Dr. Maroon is a world-renowned neurosurgeon with extensive experience in neurosurgery. He specializes in minimally invasive surgery to speed recovery for his patients. He is a sports medicine expert and innovator in concussion management, personal fitness, and nutrition. He's a clinical professor and vice chair of the Department of Neurology, Neuro Neurological Surgery and Heidi Scholar in Neuroscience at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And I'm sure Dr. Maroon is going to tell you some of the other interesting things that he's doing with sports uh, medicine. Dr. Maroon, welcome to the stage at the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. You are on. Thank you so very much, Joyce. I appreciate the introduction. And, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and to share some of my actually very personal experiences. Uh, I'm going to talk about overcoming adversity and building resilience. And perhaps the best way to do that is to uh, tell you some personal stories that, that might resonate with you at this time. So that basically we're going to cover a few different subjects. Number one, balance. What is it? What are the consequences of imbalance? A little bit about success that we all hope to attain in some way and what is success? Burnout, which is now epidemic now with this pandemic that the worst scourge in all of our medical lives uh, in the last 50 years. My personal story and uh, rather presumptuously share with you what I consider to be the secret to a balanced life. I'm going to go back many years to 1889 when William Osler, who was actually considered the father of medicine in the United States, he started the first residency program at Johns Hopkins uh, in 1890 or so. And he gave this address to the graduating medical students at the University of Pennsylvania titled Equanimitus, Equanimitus, Latin for essentially the word balance. And, and he said, he urged the students to cultivate such a judicious measure of equanimity as will enable you to confront the exigencies of practice and life without at the same time hardening the human heart by which we live. This is a, a ubiquitous problem in medicine as many of you I'm sure have experienced. He also had a caveat to this statement. He said, while preaching to you a doctrine of balance, I myself have been a castaway. And, and I wanna echo the same thing. While, while preaching to you uh, a, a talk on balance and equanimity, I've also had my, my failures. And sometimes we learn more from adversity. In fact, adversity sometimes is our very best teacher, as many of you in this audience listening now can attest. And I, um, I, I searched back in the, in the literature for the earliest story I could find about balance. And you may recall the story of Icarus, uh, the son of Daedalus, who was imprisoned in a labyrinthine prison. And to escape, Daedalus, the greatest engineer of ancient times, constructed wings made of wax and feathers. And he cautioned his son Icarus, however, before you leave and fly, be careful not to soar too high with your success, 
lest the sun melt the wax and the wings fall off and you plummet into the sea, nor fly too low, lest the waves wet the feathers and pull you into the sea. In other words, as Aristotle said, hit the mean between extremes virtually in everything we do in our lives. And this is an address I gave to a group of neurosurgeons uh, quite a few years ago when I was uh, president of the Congress of the Neurological Surgeons. And upon finishing, going back again to my residency, we were told that there are three A's of success in this world. And this I think applies almost to any profession. Number one is availability. Number two, affability. Number three is ability. You can cover up a lot of inability with availability and affability. But these were, this is what I, I was geared to attain when I finished my practice. And this quote, however, kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, John Kang, a philosopher at the University of Massachusetts wrote this book recently. He said, most of modern life is geared towards attaining success. I don't think anybody in the audience would doubt that. Power, money, status, only after it is attained does, it, does its hollowness become painfully aware to us. Well, I was bent on success when I finished my residency. I came to the University of Pittsburgh and I was appointed chief of neurosurgery at the university hospital doing very significant, I thought at least, research. And uh, I was named the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers neurosurgical consultant, the first in the NFL, actually. And I was really feeling good about things. I was soaring, you might say soaring, somewhat like Icarus with all of my, in quotes, successes. And I wasn't aware that I was unaware of other aspects of my life besides my work. And I experienced what now is, again, epidemic, burnout. 50% of people in this country experience some degree of overwork, overcommitted, uh, out of balance, overstressed, emotional exhaustion, become cynical, no time for my family. And, and I, I experienced this in spades. And, and Nietzsche, again, said it best. He said, all things must suffer, go dark, and perish before they live again. I didn't realize that until retrospectively I, I saw it because after all of my quotes blowing successes, there was a major train wreck. Uh, the wheels came off, as they say, and within the course of a single week, my father died of a ma major heart attack. My wife left with the two kids, our two, our two children in the middle of winter and I no longer could do, do, do neurosurgery. I was totally non-functional and incapacitated. And one day I was literally doing awake brain surgery, removing tumors from eloquent parts of people's brains while they were awake to avoid catastrophic neurological damage. And the next week, literally, I was living in this dark farmhouse, Dallas Pike, West Virginia, and also working in this truck stop bequeathed to my mother, heavily mortgaged, uh, and, and literally filling up 18 wheelers, flipping hamburgers, and wondering what in the world happened. How did I get here? One day, neurosurgery, the next working at a truck stop. And, and this quote also became very poignant. The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and sometimes writes another. His humblest hour is when he compares the volume as it is with what he vowed to make it. I did not write in my diary that I wanted to work in a truck stop in the, my, mid, my mid 40s after all the education that I had. And I, I would suggest to you, what, what, what are you writing in your diary? What have you written in your diary? And how does the story as it is now compare with what you intended? Well, it clearly introduced me to the problem of stress, uh, the most stressful part of my life, I must say, and uh, how it attacks the body 
and I learned very quickly and I'm having trouble advancing my slide. There we go. Uh, I learned very quickly about the mind-body connection. And as you know, the mind can make the body very sick, ulcers, heart attacks, irritable bowel syndrome. But I'm going to tell you a little bit later how the body can heal the mind. But we know the catastrophic consequences of stress on our immune system. It suppresses our ability to fight off everything from cancer, heart disease and stroke. And the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal glass axis, how our brain through the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and our endocrine organs can release adrenaline and cortisol, which does very damaging effects to our body when overproduced and how the whole thing is associated with anxiety, depression, insomnia, and even suicidal ideation at times. So we know that stress is neurotoxic. It literally destroys cells in our brains, particularly the hippocampus, which is that part of the brain that subserves memory. So people under chronic stress do indeed have memory and cognitive problems due to the neurotoxic effect of cortisol and adrenaline on our brain. So in a situation like this, and some of you may have been there after a, a terrible divorce or after the loss of a loved one, uh, a child, the, the catastrophic things that sometimes we have little control over. How do you come back? What do you do? And I was very fortunate, and this goes to Ben, a personal story back to high school. I, I received this award book, I Dare You, by William Danceforth, who is the president and founder of the uh, Purina, Ralston Purina Company in St. Louis. And it was a book given to high school seniors as a token of leadership. And I was in the farmhouse and I, I still had this book. I picked it up and I opened it again for the first time in 20 years or so. And William Danforth said, I dare you to lead a balanced life. And now, ladies and gentlemen, each of you in the audience, I want you to do something in your own minds. I want you to draw this square, work, relationship, spirituality, and physical. This really is the secret I'm talking to you about a balanced life. Now, what I want you to do in your mind, draw a line commensurate with how much effort you put in on each one of these. In other words, how much is on your work line? How much is on your relationships, spirituality, and physical? Well, I did that in that farmhouse. And this is what my square looked like. It really was like this, a flat line EKG, essentially. There was no family. There was no spirituality. And I was 20 pounds overweight because I was so committed to this. And uh, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but this excellent book by Ryan Holiday uh, says it very well. The obstacle is the way, how to turn trials into triumph. And I, again, I had no cogn cognitive awareness of what I was experiencing at the time. I was just trying to survive, but in retrospect, I'm sharing with you, sometimes adversity is the way. And it's turning how to turn that into triumph or success. So what motivated me? How, how did I come back from this really life-threatening, truly life-threatening, uh, catastrophic problems? And the first step was totally serendipitous. The banker who held the mortgage on the truck stop called me one day. I think he, want, he, he said, Joe, let's go for a run. I think he wanted to see if I'd be around long enough to pay off the mortgage. But I said, Ron, I can't walk up a flight of steps without getting short of breath. But we made it down to this track, this high school track in Wheeling, West Virginia. And I made it around four times. And I said, never again. 
I was exhausted, fatigued, hurt. And that night, however, an amazing thing happened. It was the first night I slept in literally months. So the next day I went down and did a mile and a quarter by myself and then a mile and a half and then two, three, five. And I, I, I was like Forrest Gump eventually. They, running through Wheeling, West Virginia, they, they'd say, there he goes. And then I, I decided to cross train because my legs were hurting for too much running. So I learned to swim and I learned, to, I got a bike and I entered into a mini Tin Man triathlon. And when I finished it, I, I thought I was Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. And subsequently, however, that run around the high school track led me to compete and raise the bar annually on the triathlons that I did. And this is the swim start of the Hawaiian Ironman triathlon that I did 10 years after that run around, the single run around the high school track and able to finish uh, under the 17 hour limit and uh, subsequently have done eight of these and continue to compete actually. Uh, I, I, I did a Olympic distance triathlon two weeks, three weeks ago in Columbus, Ohio, came in first in my age group. I, I have to brag about that, but in all honesty, I was also last in my age group because I was the only one in my age group. But regardless, the, the point I wanna make is that simple, in quotes, run around a high school track completely changed my life on the physical side of my square and allowed me to work on the spiritual side, the work side and the family side. So let's look at each of these individually. Let's look at the physical and the nutritional side of our squares. And so what was happening or what happened in my brain when I took that run around the high school track? Well, what happened is I increased the amount of BDNF in my brain. So what is brain-derived neurotropic factor? It's a molecule that gets released during exercise that enhances neuronogenesis, which is the formation of new brain cells, synaptogenesis, the connection between the various brain cells, and neuroplasticity, the ability to take huge amounts of information like I'm doing right now and sharing it with you. It also markedly enhanced my serotonin. What drug is one in five women in this country on for depression or anxiety? It's serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It's, it increases your serotonin level. Exercise does it, as I'm going to show you, better than drugs without the side effects. It increases acetylcholine, which enhances memory, dopamine, the feel-good hormone, norepinephrine, and also uh, anandamide, which stimulates the endocannabinoid system, which is what gets stimulated with marijuana. So it's our own endogenous marijuana, if you would. And, and this is a study showing that aerobic activity enhances cognitive ability in a randomized controlled trial. Exercise in older adults improves cognitive function. It helps you think better. It helps you process. It helps you remember better. And these are studies that uh, recently, within this year, have testified to that. And, and this says it all, the exercise cure, why it may be the best fix for depression. It's better and antidepressants and many studies have been done comparing these head to head. So the other aspect, when my father died at age 60, I thought any year beyond that for me would be a bonus because genetically I have the same body type and, and some of the same proclivities, uh, but that's not the case. And I'm going to tell you why. There's a new science that many of you may have heard about called epigenetics. Epi means above the genome, above the genome. And as you know, the genome 
our chromosomes are laid out, our, our genes are located on our chromosomes and they do nothing unless, unless they're acted upon. Genes need to be told what of 100,000 different proteins to make and what tells them what to do. Well, it's epigenetic factors above the genes, environmental aspects in which we are interacting with daily. And I, I had to throw this in because I'm so concerned about the use of marijuana and the states approving it and, and the exposure to kids with this now. This is a perfect example of epigenetics. Kids, women, women, or women who smoke marijuana during pregnancy, it's related now to psychotic symptoms, attention deficits, and social problems in their progeny. In other words, it goes transplacental and affects the connectome, the wiring diagram of the kids in the uterus. That's epigenetic. It's above the genome. Your kid wasn't born with that. And how prevalent is it? 22% of high school students now use marijuana. And those who abuse prescription opioids also use marijuana. So it's a huge problem in our country that we really need to be cognizant of in an epigenetic fashion. So these are the other major factors of epigenetics that affect who and what we are. If we eat a Big Mac infused with hormones and antibiotics, fed corn raised in Iowa sprayed with glyphosate, and then wash it down with a bottle of phosphoric acid, which is called soft drinks and sugar, 12 teaspoons of sugar, and then with trans fatty acids on our French fries, those chemicals are gonna tell our transcription factors to tell our genes to make inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory agents, which go throughout our body. What's the common cause of heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, it's inflammation. Everything we can do to reduce inflammation will help us live longer and healthier. If we don't exercise, if we're sedentary, we deposit fat in our midsection. Fat is a repository of inflammatory cytokines. And environment, we have to be careful about our air, our water, our soil, uh, and then stress. Emotional stress is very damaging to our genes, to our telomeres, which control aging to some extent or a measure of aging. And to the corollary, if we have a Mediterranean type diet, fish, vegetables, fruits, uh, a bit of calorie restriction, if you would at times, adequate polyphenols, nutritional supplements, we exercise, we have clean air, water, we don't smoke, don't drink excessively, and we have emotional health, control of stress, religion, relationships, meditation, and spirituality. This, all of these epigenetic factors tell your genes to make anti-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory agents, which help you live healthier and longer. So what are the people and Dad Butner's blue zones, where, where do they live the longest? Well, these particular areas, Sardinia, Okinawa, Seventh-day Adventist, Costa Rica Peninsula, and Icaria. Icaria is where Icarus plummeted into the sea. The island was named after him. What do they know that we don't? Well, here's what they do. They, they drink a little bit of wine strong family relationships to reduce and spirituality to reduce stress, put family first, natural movements, a sense of purpose, stress management, eating plant source diet. So the, all the epigenetic factors that we're talking about that lead to a long and healthier life. So let's look at the spiritual side of the square. Uh, this is Father 
Ephraim. Father Ephraim is a, a, a close personal friend who is head of the Greek monasteries here in the United States, a patient and friend. And he gave me this prayer rope <clears throat> uh, when, when I visited with him. And when we had a long talk, and, and as he said, the purpose of life is to gain some perspective on our lives. And that is so important. Simon Sinek said it another way. He said, what is the why of your life? What is the why? Why, why are you here? What are we doing? What's the purpose of our lives? And the purpose of our lives is a life of purpose, you might say. And so why do I segue in spirituality to this scene, which is the Iron Man start uh, in Hawaii uh, six years ago? There's a church spire here that is very spiritually inducing. The sun just coming up and you're standing on, on the ocean coast with, coast with and wondering if you're going to make it through a 140 mile 140.6 mile race. And to get through it, I, I have a little prayer, I say. And the prayer is, he who trusts in the Lord shall be renewed. He shall rise up on wings like an eagle. He shall run and not be fatigued and walk and not be weary. And I, I say this mantra over and over uh, to subdue the pain. And you might say a bit of mindfulness uh, to get through the race. So what does that have to do with this herniated disc in a nurse from a local hospital uh, who is incapacitated by weakness and pain? Well, after meeting with Father Ephraim and his prayer rope, I've made it a habit to, to ask my patients before going into the operating room, if they would like to say a little prayer. I don't proselytize, I don't try to convert anybody. Would you like to say a little prayer? Invariably, they say yes. And I'll, I, I wear the prayer rope and I'll take their hand and I'll say, today is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And with your help, get Mary or John through this operation and back to their, back to their loved ones and their work. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no more stressful time when you're waiting on a gurney to have a craniotomy or have your head operated upon or your spine. The stress level is literally sky high. The cortisol level is off the charts. That little prayer, that little touch, you literally can see the anxiety diminishing and, and the trust being engendered. Uh, so when I turned this young lady on her belly to operate on her back. This is the quote that was literally tattooed on her back. But those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I, the coincidence of this for me was simply overwhelming. And what about praying with patience? And again, some people will have violently disagreed when I discussed this. But again, I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just saying that human beings are, are capable of intense stress, anxiety, which increases the length of stay in the hospital. It increases infection rate and prayer. And there are studies purporting this can reduce both of those. The work side of the square. Well, we all know that it's a major, major side, of course. And this quote from Sixet Mihaly, a neuropsychologist at the University of Chicago at the time, in his book, Flow, The Ultimate Psychological Experience, says it well. And think about it. The best moments of our lives are when our mind or our body is stretched to its limits in the voluntary pursuit of something both difficult and worthwhile. In each of our jobs, no matter what it is almost, when you push yourself, when you stretch yourself to your limits, voluntarily, not with a, a whip to your back, uh, for something that's difficult and worthwhile, there, there's no better experience in life. It's that flow, transcendental experience. 
and and then I, I, I segue into in work, we need stress. Hans Selye, a neurophysiologist or a physiologist in Canada, wrote this book, Stress Without Distress. We need stress. And he talked about the adaptation syndrome. And he evaluated people and, and animals with severe stress. The first reaction to any stress is alarm, fight or flight. The next is adaptation or resilience. So the theme of this conference is to build resilience. You cannot build resilience without stress, but it's adapting to the stress appropriately. If you don't, there's exhaustion and death. The Japanese have a term for death for overwork called Hiroshi, literally death from overwork. So you stress means good stress, Dis, D-I-S means bad, distress. So we need stress that we want to avoid distress. And I show this because one of the things that I was, I was totally mindless of, I was not mindful of where I was and what I was doing in my earlier life. I had no awareness, as the Buddhists say. I wasn't mindful and I wasn't aware. So every day now when I get in my car, I look at my tachometer <clears throat> and I look at the red zone and I sit for 30 seconds and I say, I take my emotional temperature. How stressed am I today? And uh, I make sure that if I'm in the red zone, then I have to do things to get out of the red zone because it's too easy in today's world to get there. And the relationship side of the square, well, when I think of the three most important things in life, I think of number one, physical and mental health. We have to have these to enjoy the others. Second is relationships with God, family, friends, and colleagues. And third is carpe diem, seize the day. Every day is a blessed day when we can get up, be on the right side of the grass, as they say, and be able to function at a good level. And in relationships, John Gottman was a, he is a psychologist at the University of Washington, and he took engaged couples and put them into a stressful environment to see how they would react together in stress. And he could predict within 90% of the time which couples would get divorced. When there was criticism, contempt, counterattack, and stonewalling, the likelihood of divorce was very high. So in your own relationships, think about the presence or absence of these. And finally, I'm now in the, in the fourth quarter and I'm enjoying it more than as much as the other three, but I've also become very cognizant of the various connectings, connections in my life, connecting the dots, how things happen, how I'm talking to this group uh, about this topic and how it happened that I met Joyce and she contacted me and, and we're sharing these experiences. And so much of it is serendipity. And so a little story, a final story from Kona to Kilimanjaro. Seven, eight years ago, when I was doing the Ironman in Hawaii, the last leg, the marathon, is run through the darkened lava fields outside of Kona and is pitch black. And I, I got to the point of mile 130 and I was hyponatremic, exhausted, depleted. And I, I, I literally mentally quit. I just shuffled along until I heard behind me click, 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 getting closer. A hand reached out, touched me on the shoulder and said, hey, 227, you're too close to quitting. Come on, follow me. And I, in my delirium, uh, I thought this guy has no idea where I am and I'm ready to collapse. But then a car came in the opposite direction and shined its light 
on this individual. And it turned out to be Rajesh Durbal. Rajesh Durbal was the first triple amputee to finish the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon. And this man is telling me, come on, you can't quit now. Well, he went on to finish and I, I finished after him. And serendipitously, we met in a restaurant the next day and uh, we became fast friends. Uh, three years ago, he called me and he said, hey, Joe, he said, hey, Joe, I'm taking a group of differently enabled athletes, not disabled, differently enabled athletes to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And you've been elected to be the team doctor. I said, Rajesh, who elected me? He said, I did. So I called my daughter, Isabella, and Bella, would you like to drop out of school for a couple of weeks and go to Africa? Of course, dad, let's do it. So we spent five days climbing, sleeping in tents and on the rocks and summiting Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,000 feet with these individuals. This, this individual here has one leg, no legs and one arm, one arm, one leg, and no arms. And I, I noticed that he was carrying this golf club, this driver in his backpack. And I, I had no idea why. And we got to the top and he said, my dream has always been to drive a golf ball off of the top of Kilimanjaro. And, and we caught him doing that. So ladies and gentlemen, going back to William Osler, I, I would leave with a, a quote, be calm and strong and patient meet failure and disappointment with courage, rise superior to the trials of life, which each of us has on a daily basis, never give in to hopelessness or despair, in danger and adversity, cling to your principles, your ideas, your God, your family, your friends, and your square. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this book summarizes most of much of what I talked about today. And uh, Sanjay Gupta said it has already changed his life. Uh, it's been a great pleasure sharing these thoughts with you and I hope some of it uh, resonates and it's something you can use. Thank you very much. Oh my, I have taken so much notes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Maroon, my goodness. What is one question you get commonly asked when you do this presentation, Dr. Maroon? Well, I, you know, I, I, a lot of people have reached out to me really in despair. And, you know, I tell them, for me, exercise saved my life. Mm -hmm. It rebalanced my neurotransmitters. It restored my brain. It helped my body in terms of losing weight, all as the unintended side effect of doing what I should have been doing all along. So, but that's not for everyone. Some people have resource to spirituality, getting back to, to God, their earlier beliefs, uh, and, and other people have very strong family units that come to the rescue. Mm -hmm. Each of these in their own way and all together really contribute to equanimity and balance that we all strive for. So that, that's my response to the question as well. Mm -hmm. I love, uh, you know, those of you here, Dr. Maroon's book, The Four Square, is available in the Summit Marketplace, and there is, I think, a 15% discount. There is, he's actually made it discounted for our audience today. So get your copy on the Marketplace on the website at the Global Workplace Wellness Summit.com uh, uh, slash shop. The reality is that there are so many people right now, Dr. Maroon, at work, who are feeling disconnected with everything. 
And um, especially we're going through this global pandemic, there's so much more, um, there's so much more challenges around uh, people feeling well and people uh, depression and anxiety and, and stress and overwhelm. I know I just got invited to um, to to be a guest speaker on the TV next week, and these are some of the things that are coming up. So, what do you say to people at this time where they're saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, all good," but this is this is the pandemic. It's ruining my life. I can't even go to the gym. Well, Joyce, what you're describing is what we mentioned earlier, burnout. I mean, that's the colloquial term that's being used for overwork, overcommitted, overexhausted, overstressed, burnout. burnout. In physicians, 55% of physicians experience this. The general population, it's 45 to 50% in the workforce. Now, more than ever, because of homeschooling plus a job, uh, and do you have a job? Am I going to have a job? Am I going to get laid off next week? Uh -huh. I mean, it, it's a horrible, catastrophic situation for the country and, and the people in it now. And to maintain balance and equanimity, you know, it sounds like pie in the sky. The only message, I, I keep getting back to basics <clears throat> and Chuck Knoll, who is a Super Bowl coach for the Pittsburgh Steelers for many years, whom, whom I know knew personally, he said, football is not complicated. I mean, you see the ins and outs and the deep and all that stuff. He said, it, it's about blocking and tackling. He says, the people who block and tackle best win. And it's the same with what you're talking about. Life is not complicated. The basics are what we're talking about right now. It's about, are we aware and mindful of what we're doing at work? Do we have a family unit that is there for us when we need them? Do we have a spiritual connection to realize that there are things beyond our control and we can reach out in our own minds for help, uh, depending on your own religious or spiritual preference? And also the importance of exercising our bodies, of the physical, the, the psychopharmacological changes that occur in your brain and your body when you just walk 30 minutes a day. 30 to 40 minute walk a day would cut the incidence of diabetes, which is the most common cause for blindness, amputation, and kidney transplantation almost in half. 30 minutes a day of walking will reduce the incidence of diabetes. Mm. You just, again, we have to do it. We have like, to. Like the Nike ad. Yes. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. I want to read some of the comments in the chat for you. Thank you very much for your inspiration. That was an incredibly uplifting presentation. Thank you so much for your divine knowledge and experience. I had many takeaways from your talk and will be looking for your book. Yeah, please do go to the marketplace. Amina, can you put the link to the marketplace on uh, for, for the audience? <clears throat> uh, next one, Dr. Maroon, thank you so much for that very inspirational talk. I'm very moved by it. Uh, what do you think needs to happen to address the epidemic of depression and anxiety among our youth? And, um, and this is a question uh, directed to, uh, when you look at the, the state of our young people, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a world that is so rapidly evolving because of social media and instantaneous news so much of which is so biased, both ways, always. I mean, the, the goal of much of the media now is sensationalism yes. and clickbait. The article that I write is going, the most clicks I get, the more I get paid. The wrong incentives. It's not the truth. Uh, and, and we've seen this certainly in, in our country mm -hmm. for the last six months. So uh, incredible bias and uh, uh, 
and so it, it's difficult, but again, it's getting back to basics. Exercise, spirituality, family, friendship, and keeping work in perspective as best we can. I mean, that's the, and then, you know, we, we may need counseling at times. Yes. And, and there are, there are new ways of, and I didn't get into this in the talk about the connectome, which is the wiring diagram of the brain and how various energy sources like transcranial magnetic stimulation, photobiomodulation, direct current stimulation. There are a lot of tools now that practitioners have available to facilitate rewiring the brain, so to speak. There are a lot of modern approaches to this <clears throat> that, that are available. And uh, so the, these are things that speaking to a professional, a psychologist, psychiatrist, they, they may, if, if psychotropic drugs are ineffective, uh, there are other ways of getting help. You're very right because the news is always on and, and um, they consume a lot more social media now than we did in our time and, and you did in your time. And the, the, the youth, their brain is still growing and with all of that uh, social media and always on and the sensationalism, as a neurosurgeon, knowing, um, I, I know there are some parents on here, uh, the, we hear that the, the youth, the brain isn't fully developed until a certain time. And uh, with the exposure to many of those sensationalization, can that have an impact? <clears throat> yes. I mean, everything you said, I agree with. Okay. All right. Okay, so there's another comment. Thank you for your honesty and inspiration. Also, thank you for all your contributions to medicine. You're truly a remarkable person and um, your contributions are amazing. I, I don't know what else to say beside thank you. Thank you so much for uh, gracing us at the Global Workplace Wellness Summit and sharing your thoughts, your perspectives and your wisdom with us. I feel like I could just go home. The day is done. <laughs> well, I've had much. my fill. But <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go back to the, the disclaimer of William Osler with his admonition to Equanimitas when he said, while preaching to you a doctrine of balance, I myself am a castaway. So I, <laughs> I don't profess to any, um, I, I've, I've, been there and, and fallen a lot of times. J.C. Penney had a, a great story. He was asked at the end of his life by a young writer, Mr. Penny, if you could summarize in one sentence what you've learned in building 2,000 stores across the United States, what would it be? And he thought for a minute and he said, when you fall, get up. Mm. Oh, I so, love that. I love that. Yeah, I, I love um, and, <laughs> And I've been fortunate to get up a few times, few times. Oh, what a blessing to be able to get up. And I, and I think that is it to have the will and the resilience to get up. And I think that's your testimony to that with your story of getting up. And, and I love the, the analogy you shared this morning of um, don't fly too high with success. And, um, and there are some people who just came on. Can you share that again so they can hear that? It was uh, the story, I think it was from Gre the Greek uh, story. Um, Icarus. Icarus, yeah. yeah. Icarus. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's a, you know, the, I, I talked about the three A's of success, availability, affability, and ability. There are three A's of failure as well. Arrogance, avariciousness, and adversarial personality. So the arrogance that is, has been, it's very easy in medicine to feel superior or above. Uh, and uh, it, it's feeling of hubris. The Greeks call it hubris. And it's clearly a very fatal characteristic. Mm. Wow. I'm so glad this is being recorded. <laughs> Will I get a copy of this? I will be, it's recorded. Uh, we are recording every word, Dr. Maroon. <laughs> Thank you. We are so, Judith, did you have a question? 
you know okay thank you thank you so much it was a wonderful presentation and i am i am just excited let's give dr maroon a big hand Thank you, Thank you so you much, Joyce. Up this morning with so, such inspiration and, and verb for the day. <laughs> well, it's been my, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye so now. please, uh, there is a link in the chat where you can get Dr. Maroon's book. Uh, you can pick it up to, um, uh, to get more of his wisdom. <laughs> the entire book, The Four Square. Love the analogy, love the concept. And it's a great opportunity for us to build. I mean, we've had so much uh, amazing, so many amazing talks and inspiration here at the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. So this was just another one of them. And uh, I thank you so much, Dr. Maroon, for sharing with us. Patience, you're here. You're going to have more time today, Patience. What about some extra time? Are you up for that? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Patience is our, our breath and energy break um, sponsor for the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. She has been here with us every day, every morning, waking us up and getting us going and fired up for the day. So, I'm going to just do uh, one more mute patient. So you might have to unmute yourself after this and, uh, and go ahead and um, lead us out into, uh, into the morning so we can get our breathing right and get our day on right with none other than the breath specialist, Patience Hemingway. Woohoo! Good morning. Everybody turn your cameras on. Hey, Judith, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. You've seen me for three days. Come on, turn your camera on. We're not strangers anymore. Please, let's, let me see your beautiful faces. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Hey, Layla, Layla, Victoria. Hey, hey I knew it. <laughs> Good morning. All right, so today we're going to shake up a little, okay? We're going to shake ourselves up. Who, oh, yes. Go, girl. Go, girl. You All have right. 10 extra who's, minutes. Who's next? Camera, camera, camera. Mm -hmm. All right. So I do not own the right to this music, but we're going to get up. Everybody get up. We're going to twist. fun with it, right? <laughs> oh, Loretta said that was great. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's take a, a breather. Okay. Let's inhale through our nose. Close your eyes. Place a smile on your face. Inhale. Exhale. You can do it through pursed lips or through your nose. 
whichever is comfortable. Let's go. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Now bring your attention to the back of your eyelids and blink twice and open up and come back. Wow, that was amazing. I enjoyed myself. I hope you did. <laughs> um, if you have a glass of water, please take a sip because it's always important to stay hydrated, guys. Hydration is very, very important. I can't emphasize that enough. As we are exhaling and inhaling, we are losing water, okay? So you want to always stay high. Yes, Joyce, that's a huge one. I like that. Leadership by example. Oh, yes, I have to empty this today. <laughs> good, 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 good. Today, we are going to focus on, hey, Nissan, welcome, welcome. Today, we're going to focus on our breathing that will help us with our liver, okay? Anyone knows what the liver does for us? The liver is a detoxifier, okay? It detoxifies our body, all right? Anything that we take in, it does the extra job overload to make sure that we are detoxified. What is the emotion of the liver? The liver receives, whenever we're angry, frustrated, jealous, envious, that emotion that goes in the file, in the folder is stored in the liver. I don't know if anyone can see the liver today. Where are you? Ooh, here it is. Yeah. Okay, the liver is right here. So the liver is on your left, your right side, okay? The right side, this way. So because of what we'll be doing, you have to visualize where it is so we can exhale and inhale into it and release the emotions that is being. Can you see now, Judith? Yeah. Okay, so right here is the liver, all right? Of course, it's close to your heart and this is your diaphragm, all right? This is our diaphragm. And the diaphragm has over 60% of our lymph nodes. Do we know what the lymph node does? It helps with the drainage, okay? The whole body, let's say, has 100%. 60% is right here. So if someone is telling you, you need to detoxify, detoxify, focus on your breath. That is why breath work is so important to me. When you breathe, there are 60% of them right under here. So if you're moving it the right way, you are being taught how to do it properly, you are detoxifying yourself. Your breath is so powerful. There's so much healing in it. It affects your heart rate, calms it down. Now we're going to focus on the liver all right so yesterday we talked about the kidneys you guys remember that right okay so today is about the liver so i want you to now close your eyes okay like i said it's in the folder up here so we're going to delete look in there and any time that you have ever been angry i know some people are saints they never get mad they've never been frustrated they've never been anxious but me oh my mom knows she's been saying patience i named you patience <laughs> I said, Mom, why did you name me Patience? This is so not cool. Change my name. So I know I, I have been, I have, I've been angry before. I've been frustrated before. So if anything at all has made you ever frustrated, has made you ever be angry, those emotions were stored in the liver. And today we are going to use breath work to release them, to release them, to detoxify the liver and then tonify the liver through the power of breath work. Are we ready to do that? All right, so now close your eyes. I want you to picture your liver. As I mentioned, it is on your right side, right under your, your chest. <laughs> For the women, it's right under the left, right under the right breast, okay? So the men, you can find it right in that area. That is where the liver is. So I want you to picture, have an image of it, and then fix a smile, smile to your liver. I want you in your own heart to say thank you for all the hard work you've been doing, for, for detoxifying my body, for keeping me healthy, for, 
for releasing bile, for, re for, for releasing bile and cholesterol, for doing all the good work that you have been doing to keep me alive. Okay, so let us thank with a smile. The smile is the connection between your brain and your liver because your brain knows where it is. So you want to fix that smile. Now I want you to take your hands and put it in front of your, your, your frontal, your prefrontal cortex. Okay, so we're going to move from right to left 18 times as we are moving our eye sockets from left, from, from right to left to delete whatever emotions, negative emotions that have been stored in the liver. So the liver has two parts also, it has left and right. So let's start doing it. Hands in front of our face and let's move from right to left. One, two, move your eyes. Three, four, five, six, seven. Eyes moving, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Good, we have deleted the file from the brain. Now bring your hand towards the liver area where I showed you on your right side. So keep it the same way and we're going to move it from right to left 18 times. Let's go fix that smile. It's all gratitude. We're saying thank you. We're taking the junk out and we're going to detoxify and tonify this liver because we need it. Let's go. One, two, with a smile. Three, move your eyes from left to right. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eyes moving. Eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, good. Wow, good job guys. Now I want you to put your palms on your knees, okay? Feet apart, palms on your knees. Good job guys. We're going to inhale and then on your exhale, we're going to do the liver sound. It is called sh, sh, okay? Shh. You don't have to make it louder. The, the more you do it internally, the vibration will vibrate the liver, okay? It's all an inside job. All right, let's go now. Inhale. Lift up those hands from your knees all the way up over your head. Interlace. Interlace your fingers, if you can see mine. And stretch opposite from your liver. So it, mean, it means that you are going to go to your left side so that there'll be tension. Yes, good job, Layla, you got that. So you're going to go to the opposite side so there'll be tension on your right side so when we exhale, it would actually do the job. So now let's exhale. Bring your hand down slowly, slow motion, okay? There's no rush in the galaxy, everything is moving slowly in the cosmic. So you want to just go with the flow, slowly bring it back onto your knees. Inhale one more time, the hands are gonna go up, inhale. Smile, 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 smile. Lock the hands up, twist towards your left so that there is tension on your Right hand side so the liver can feel the stretch and now exhale with the sound. Release slowly, slowly. Do not rush the process. We detoxify the liver. It always detoxifies us. Today, we are detoxifying it. One more time. Let's go. Inhale through your nose. Fill up the belly. Fill up the belly, knowing that there are over 60% of your lymph node right under your diaphragm, and they are helping you also. Interlace the fingers. Exhale. Shh. Bring it down slowly, slowly be patient with the process. 
You're doing a great job. Thank you, liver. Thank you, liver. Thank you, liver. Thank you, liver. Now with your arms, with your palms on your, on your knees, we're going to rock from side to side. We have released the emotion. Rock from side to side. The pelvic floor always gets the hidden frustrations. You are mad at somebody, you're frustrated, you're angry, but you are not saying it because you just want to look professional, but it's eating you away on the inside. It is not good for your liver. Once the liver is overloaded, it will start releasing acid into the stomach, right? Even when there's no food in it, once you are stressed and the stimuli is received through any of your senses, it will go through your amygdala and then the amygdala will tell the adrenal gland to produce the stuff into, into the heart and all the body and the liver will go like, what should I do? What should I do? So we'll release more acid into the duodenum, release it into the intestine. Let us start digesting and eating away the intestine, right? Everything is connected. So you want to release that from your pelvic floor into the earth, release it, keep rocking. You know what you are frustrated at right now. You know what is making you angry. I want you to release it. Release, forgive, forget, let go. As you are rocking, forgive, forget, let go. Someone made you mad. Someone didn't appreciate what you did. Someone did something. Someone cut in front of you. Release, forgive, forget, let go. Because if you don't release it, it will still be in you, okay? Release it into the ground. Release it. Release it. All right. Okay, you're doing a great job. Now, I would like you to lift up those hands and now break it in front of your, your liver again. And now we're going to, in a circular motion, we're going to circle joy, love, peace. Right now we have taken away the frustration, okay? We have deleted it. So the next thing we're going to do is to turn in good energy into the place. So we want more love. So circulate it around your liver, okay? Let's go. Good, good, Layla, good job. More of it. See yourself receiving more love, joy, peace, kindness. The opposite of being angry is being kind. So you have kindness all over you right now. Kindness. You'll be kind with your words, kind with your gestures, kind with your emails, kind with the way you react. You rather respond. Respond because it's all about workplace wellness our actions, the events, and our responses brings out the outcome. So once we take care of the inside, it will naturally show in how we respond to things. We'll respond kindly to issues. We'll respond kindly to issues. So keep multiplying that joy, that love, that peace, that gentleness and kindness. See yourself exuding so much kindness so much kindness keep doing it keep doing it because you are that powerful you are in control no one pushes your buttons you are in charge yes and keep smiling because you are so beautiful you are all that you are powerful beyond measure keep doing it yes it also the, the liver is connected to the gallbladder as all of you know already so you want to make sure that as you're doing that, you're sending love and light, kindness and gentleness to the liver also, okay? And it's green. The color of the liver is green, 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 healing. It's so beautiful. You are being filled up right now with so much kindness and gentleness. So beautiful. All right, now let's lift up our hands again one more time, slowly. Inhale on your way up. Big, big smile because we have so much kindness and gentleness. Let's lock it in there. Turn to the left. Exhale. Shh. 
Release, come back slowly. You know, it took years for all the emotions to get there. So don't think that it's just one time and, oh, it's all done. It's a continuous practice. It should be part of your daily ritual before you even go behind your desk. Let's go up one more time. Inhale. Fill up that belly. Fill it out. Fill it out. Diaphragmatic breathing. Stretch, stretch, stretch. Move to the right as much as you can. Stretch it out. Exhale with the sound. Shh. Release it slowly, 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 slowly. Wow, this is so beautiful. So beautiful, so beautiful. Put your hands on your knees and rock. Rock, rock, rock. Rock to the left, rock to the side. Release forgive, forget, let, let it go. It's very important at this point, okay? Holding on to it, it's only poison to us. So rock to the left, rock to the right. Picture that person and mention their name in your own head and say, I forgive you, I release you, I let you go. If it is your manager, your boss, your partner making you mad, giving you frustrations, whatever it is, you are that powerful to just say, I release you, I forgive you, I let you go. Release, forgive, forget, let go. Because you love your liver so much, you love your gallbladder so much, you love every part of you so much, you will not let one person or a group of person behavior bring you so much stress and anxiety that you start poisoning your own inside with so much cortisol, so much adrenaline, and now it'll start affecting you. You are not able to sleep. You have so much headaches. You have stomach aches. It's affecting every part of your life. No more. Release, forgive, forget, let go. Good job, guys. Now open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes. How was that? I had so much fun. <laughs> so that was great, Patience. So Patience, tell us a little bit about how the audience can get hold of you. I know you wrote a book. I know you also have some free, um, you have a handout in the swag bag. You yeah. Book. Do you also have classes? that are virtual? Do you, do you uh, provide uh, these kinds of services that um, those who want to follow you can? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, I'm a, I'm a certified life coach and a master serenity coach. So I take people through this. And if you want to follow me on Patient Serenity Grove on, on Facebook, and I have this over 6,000 women in an anxiety support group on Facebook. We support each other every day. And I do have a signature program known as the 30 Days Anxiety to Serenity Transformation course. It's an online course. You get to do it at your own pace. So most people like that. It's always sold out. So you can um, sign up for that. And also, yes, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching services and I focus more on people in the workplace. This is amazing because right in the workplace, we all put in on so much faces and then there are things going on on the inside. So it is my goal and my desire that everyone will show up with their authentic self, meaning that we have taken care of everything on the inside, right? Because this is more important. When everything in here is all right, we will show up and be very productive. Very, very productive. So yes, I'm available for corporate offices. Um, if your, your office wants a one-on-one -on -one session or a group session, I'm available for that. Please reach out to me. My email address is patientsreadygrow at gmail.com. So reach out to me and also get the swag bag. More information on there. Thank you so much. Yes, so you can go in the in the marketplace. We also have a free offer from uh, from patients, and we'll be sharing that. Uh, look out for an email from us next week with freebies from all our speakers and presenters. There's just been so much. Have you guys been 
shifted by the summit so far. Put your hand up if you have had so much. It's been so full. I need to download. I'm so glad this is recording. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We're seeing the yes in the chat. And don't forget the Apollo technology is also in the summit uh, marketplace and it's 15% off for our speaker, for our audience as well. And it will be there for the next uh, couple of weeks. So make sure that you pay attention to all the offers and uh, that's been there. Dr. Maroon's book, Patience has a book as well. All of these uh, tons and tons of resources that we become familiar with that's helping us through um, our, our work days, right? Allowing us to have phenomenal work days so that we can uh, just be more of what we are and uh, have better workplaces. Wow, so, so much. I am so excited to um, move us on. We have our next speaker is going to be uh, Rene Moorefield. And uh, Rene, I'm just gonna make you co-host. And uh, so you can share your screen with us. Patience, a big thank you uh, for, for our relaxation session. So Rene, you're getting us all relaxed and healthy and breathing properly. So we're all super engaged and looking forward to your session. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Rene is CEO of Wisdom Works, a firm dedicated to building leaders and organizations who are committed to unleashing human potential for well-being, innovation, optimal performance, and positive impact. Among her clients have been the Coca-Cola Company, Nike, Hermes uh, of Paris, Brelia Group, Booz, Allen Hamilton, Cox, Cox Aut Automotive, and Hyatt and Merck and Company. She advises leaders in using an untapped asset, human thriving, to boost the power of their brands, workplaces, and effective effectiveness everywhere they go. Um, I everywhere they lead. So this morning it is my pleasure to welcome Rene for uh, to share with us on leadership in this time that we're living in. Rene, welcome to the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, delighted to be here. I was really looking forward to this and I, I feel honored, Joyce, that uh, you invited me and that you're doing this summit. It is, it's really so needed. So thank you for that. I'm going to share my screen so that I can show you all a few things. Um, I also encourage you to use the chat function. If there's something that resonates with you, um, please do that. And I will definitely leave time at the end of this presentation for questions and answers. I, in fact, I love getting questions from people because it helps me know what's most interesting to you. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'll check in with you here to make sure can you see my screen? Can set, Patience, you're the only one I'm seeing on my yes, screen. So I've got a thumbs up from Patience. Yes, Good. we can see your screen. Awesome. That's terrific. That's terrific. So I am appreciating this collection of um, HR leaders, leadership development practitioners, OD people, wellness professionals, all of us coming together to um, create environments where people thrive. And we know that we're in a very stressed out um, time around our planet. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about in our, in this age of complexity. Join the meeting. In this age of complexity, what does it mean to lead from well-being? Um, before I do that, whoops, hold on for one second. Let me do one thing here. It puts you on the wrong slide. I put you on the wrong slide. There we go. Before I do that, it sounds like patients already um, ensured that everyone is in a wonderful and rejuvenated space, but I wanna join you. So I want us to do a couple of sighs together. To me, I find that sighing is one of the best ways to really shift into this 
physiological state of well-being and inner balance. So wherever you are, I would love for you to, if you're sitting, notice the weight of your body in the chair. Um, if you would like to even be more present to the experience, allow your back to move away from the back of your chair instead of leaning back, just to create some alertness in the body. If you're standing like I am, notice, bring your attention to the soles of your feet. And if your eyes are open, if it feels comfortable, feel free to close your eyes or allow that gaze to soften, even maybe noticing the muscles around your eyes, letting the eyeballs relax back into the sockets and become very present just for the moment of your body from head to toe. And with your next breath, make it a sigh, inhaling your shoulders all the way up to the, your ears and dropping them with a sigh, <sighs> making it audible. And inhale the shoulders to the ears and a big sigh. <sighs> and one more time, inhaling it all the way up and a big sigh. <sighs> Allowing your breath to return to normal, just notice the effects of that simple practice, three sighs, on your body, on your energy, on your presence, with yourself and with this community. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. If your eyes are not already open, this is exactly the type of shift, this shift into full presence and well being that we are calling on leaders around the world to make in this age of um, complexity. So, in this presentation today, I'm going to go big picture first and talk about the age that we're in and how that's affecting our organizations, our leadership, our lives. And then I'm gonna move into a framework we built that looks at six dimensions, six pathways to well-being based on the science of well-being and, and talk to you about how these might be possibilities, invitations you can make to the leaders you serve. So that's where we're headed. And I'm gonna, I've got lots of slides, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this pretty quickly because I have a sense after talking with Joyce, that this is a pretty educated, um, educated group. And I wanna leave some time for questions to go where you all wanna go. So the age of anxiety, I, I, I bet if I ask you to raise your hands and obviously I can't see everyone on the screen cause I'm looking at my slides. But if I ask you to raise your hands, I bet we would get a lot of hands saying, we agree, we're all in the age of anxiety. This is a time filled with volatility, filled with complexity, filled with um, ambiguity, filled with this sense of deep level of uncertainty. And we know that when we are in a place of this deep uncertainty, deep disquiet, that we are more apt to contract instead of expand, we are more apt to react from stress rather than open into a place of well-being and wisdom. Now on every level, there are many, um, a confluence of things that have come together to create this age of anxiety, everything from the pandemic to economic unrest, to racial tensions, to uh, global health issues, to the future of the workplace, not even knowing what that future of the workplace is gonna look like. So it makes sense that we are all feeling this. We are all feeling this level of vulnerability. My question is always to myself and the leaders I serve, does it make sense to react out of that anxiety or to find those practices that allow us to move back in to a place of self-care, well-being and resilience? Because I believe that's where we'll find greater wisdom to some of these the complex challenges that we face. We are seeing um, the stresses on many levels. Number one, the latest Gallup poll shows that 85% of employees 
across the globe or disengaged or actively disengaged. And I'm just showing you a, a, a few of many stats we could talk about. Number two of those employees that are engaged, so they are engaged at work, 61% of them um, are not thriving in their lives overall and they are more apt to experience work uh, burnout because they have this full energy at work but aren't experiencing thriving in their whole lives so they're more likely to tend towards this stress worry and burnout and then of the women um, that that were polled by zen business 89 percent said not only am i dealing with high stress women leaders but i also hide it from my employees, I hide it from others because I, I, I am concerned that I might pollute that employee experience. So I'm hiding it. And you can imagine what it happens when, when women and men, when anyone turns stress inward and instead of transmuting it and productively engaging with it to turn it into actions for well being. Um, at a personal level, we're, we're all feeling it as well. Um, isolation and loneliness have, have, are, are rising. We're experiencing blurred lines between work and home, um, changes with elderly or kids. For instance, um, I can tell you a personal, my personal story. My parents, um, I lost my father during the pandemic and my mother and my stepfather live just down the road and often are scared to leave their house because they're scared of getting the coronavirus. Um, they haven't been able to see their grandchildren. They've, they've got a new grandbaby. They've not been able to see her at all. So, I mean, this is creating a lot of disconnection. Um, there's a high degree of elderly fearing, fearing a fear of death. Um, and then in kids at home, not having access to schools. So for some kids, school is the place that they get the, the most nutritious meals. So we have lots of stress with changes with elderly and kids in the home. Engaging without thriving, I just talked about. Um, if you are truly engaged in your work and you're, you're, you're driving hard and you're doing more and more work, but not feeling thriving in your life overall, a greater degree of burnout, stress, worry, and exhaustion are on the rise. And then we're also seeing greater health risks in certain jobs. For instance, our essential workers who every day are going to jobs knowing that they are exposing themselves to a virus, that alone is stressful and, and believing that, that they may be bringing that back into their homes is stressful as well. So thinking about police, fire, um, our healthcare workers as examples. So all of us, I imagine if I asked you to Ready? put- Yes. Do you want us to see your slides? You're not seeing my slides? They are not advancing. Oh. Uh, can you can you click the slide share on your slide on your PowerPoint? Yeah, it is clicked. No, it's not. We're seeing all your screens. We're seeing the slide share. Go up to the PowerPoint. I uh, I yes, that's that's where I was. On my end, that's where it's showing that I was. Okay, so go back on and we'll just direct you a little. So go up to slide share, slide show. Uh, Are you seeing my slides right now? We're seeing your computer and your slides, but we're not, the slides are not advancing on our side. Okay, so I don't, I'm not sure why. So I will tell you why, just go to slideshow. Dr. Maroon had the same thing and we were able to walk him through. So if you, if you, if you see your screen now on PowerPoint, just go up, you look at home and you just follow that menu to slideshow. Yeah, click on, go back, go, go down to the left, go to the left of that menu. The left of the menu, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Right, <laughs> okay, just stay on home, go on home. And ah, oh, you just clicked over it. Slideshow. Click on it again. Go back. Yeah. Click on the on slideshow. Go back down. Your mouse is just above it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the bottom of your screen. You're going to see a little computer like show this and um at the bottom of your PowerPoint slides. Yes, click like that. right here. Click that. Yes. And and yes, that's what I clicked before. And it's saying sharing is paused. I'll click again. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, um, then you're just going to have to advance them yourselves. So I, I will advance it myself. So have you not seen any of the slides so far? 
No, we only saw um, those three top ones there. We haven't seen anything else. Okay. Well, we will fix that right now. <laughs> Sorry. No, not a problem. I'm glad you told me because I was, uh, as you could tell, on a roll here. So, so you saw this one? We're just seeing it now. Yes. Okay. So, the, so I talked about the agent anxiety. Okay, good. Now we're seeing the stats. Great. Thanks. Okay. So they were animated. And for some reason, when I animate, when I show you the animation is when it stops sharing and I'm not sure why. Okay. But we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to no. not do the animation and we're going to move on. Excellent. Okay, so these are these were the, the stats that I was just sharing with you. And then I was also talking about, I went down a checklist. This would show up as a checklist of all the things that um, people are dealing with and all of us in this call, I'm sure, are dealing with as well. In fact, I really encourage you guys to put in the chat box right now, since we've already had a big pause here, put in the chat box, and Joyce, I'm going to ask you to look at the chat for me. Which of these are, are you resonating with right now? Are you dealing with right now? Sense of isolation and more loneliness, blurred lines between work at home, changes with elderly or kids. So maybe having elderly in your home or kids at home full time, feeling you're engaging but not thriving overall, stress, worry, or exhaustion, and maybe a job that you're in that, that creates greater health risks for you. And Joyce, tell me what you're seeing in the chat. Engagement without thriving. Yeah. Loneliness, not thriving overall. I'm out of work, so that alone is stressful. Uh, not seeing grandchildren isolation. Yeah, great. Not great that we're dealing with this, but great that we can empathize that we are not unique with to what the rest of the population is going, you know, going on with the rest of the population as well. We can. There is one you don't have on your list that came up trying to balance parenting and working. Yeah, but blurred lines between work and home. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Okay. So here is the good news. Well, actually, this one doesn't work without animation. So you guys, you, you will, since animation is not working on my side, we'll just have to all pretend we see this. Um, when we are stressed, when we are feeling this level of stress, um, we will tend to move into a place of contraction. And when we do that, we are more likely to distrust, distrust ourselves, distrust others, distrust what messages we're receiving in the world around us, we're more likely to want to take control because we're trying to get a control of our situation, makes total sense. And we're more likely to stick with the familiar routines, practices, things we've done in the past to solve our problems, thinking that those might be the same things that help us now. And sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. The truth is that none of us know what is gonna happen next. We are all experiencing this deep level of uncertainty and, and um, transition. And we don't know transition toward what. We're all in the middle of creating that movement forward. The good news is that while we have this kind of age of anxiety that we are, we are in the middle of, and I wanna acknowledge it and recognize that we are all experiencing it, there's also a global movement to prioritize wellness and well-being. And I'm gonna show you a couple of slides that give you some um, indicators of why I believe that. One are the well-being indices that are now cropping up around the world. This is just a few of the many from um, everything from the uh, Sovereign Wellbeing Index of New Zealand, the Australian Unity Index, to um, the Gross National Happiness Index that grew up in Bhutan, the Genuous Progress Indicator, um, the UAE Wellbeing Global Survey, really all over the world. Countries are starting to say, okay, it's not enough to just focus on creation of wealth. We need to look at how do we generate well-being? How do we create environments where people can thrive? And we're, we're measuring that at a country level. So that's a good thing. 
The other movement that's happening is um, the global wellness economy. For the first time a few years ago, um, the Global Wellness Institute put their arms around this economy. How are people through their purchase decisions, um, purchasing, buying goods and services for the sole purpose of improving their lifestyle, improving their wellness? And there are 11 sectors. This 11th sector of mental wellness was just added last week when the research was kind of unveiled at the Global Wellness Summit. And it's a $4.5 trillion market. By the way, if any of you are interested in this research, you can go to the globalwellnessinstitute.org and find it. But $4.5 trillion market that we are spending on goods and services to support our health and well being globally. Just to give you some perspective, that's about three times the size of Global Pharma. So it's enormous. At a company level, so now I'm taking us down from this big picture country to industry to a company level, um, more and more companies are seeing well being as a differentiator to attract, develop, and retain employees. This is, these are a few, a very short list of nine companies. There's also close to over 3,500 companies that are part of the B Corps, which is a movement to use business for good, you know, to consciously use business for the sake of good and well being of people. Um, so, this is a movement that's happening around the world. Well being research is also exploding. So this slide purposefully, if this seems busy, it's purposeful because I could put hundreds of circles on this slide showing you the links between um, different facets that we're measuring like profitability of an organization and well-being, employee well-being for instance. We are seeing so many links between when we pay attention to the well-being of people People naturally have healthier lifestyles. They are naturally more able to buffer stress. They heal more rapidly from injury and disease. Um, they have less illness and disease. They use healthcare less. They are living longer, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the new ones that are showing up, again, this is normally an animation, so I'll just kind of point to it. Um, brand effectiveness, some new research is showing that brands that focus on the well-being of consumers are um, are doing better. They are more effective. They're 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 being more effective in the market. Um, some latest research by the Ogilvy Market Research Company is also showing that consumers now globally, 73% of consumers expect wellness to be part of the brand strategy. So consumers are becoming more sophisticated, and we are starting to see more links between when we really prioritize well-being. It shows up in so many of our metrics. I think that we are building a new leadership capability. And when I say leadership, I'm not just talking about an individual leader. I'm talking about the leadership of a brand, the leadership of an organization, the leadership of a nation. And it's a movement, it's the integration of well-being into leadership where the past was looking at um, just health and wellness was just about not being sick. Um, now we're talking about being more effective through our well being and resilience, really using that as a resource. Where the past was about well being being an afterthought, now we're seeing it more as an asset. Where in the past we were about performing more to what we know, now we're talking about how do we become more adaptable and adaptive, and to do that, we are more successful at doing that when that comes from a place of well-being instead of reactivity. And we're in the past being highly stressed out and lots of activity and busy all the time was a badge of honor. Now, more and more um, leaders and organizations are saying a thriving culture inside the company and outside the company is vital to our, or to our agenda. So we're now looking at how can well-being support us to be more expansive, to create more trust, partnership, take risks and adapt and innovate. And what a better time in this, in this age of anxiety that I described, um, this upheaval to start to create this new capacity. Central to this 
is the capacity to thrive. And I'm gonna spend a little time on what does it mean to thrive and what are the dimensions of thriving that, that can support all of us as we um, operate as leaders, but also as we serve leaders. So the definition I'm using for thriving is thriving is an internal resource to meet our demands and evolve. Think about this for a second. So we've got this, these complex demands, all of us are swimming in this complex world, this age of anxiety. How do we tap into this psychological and biological resource as a living system, which we all are, as a living system, we, we are innately wired not just to survive, we are innately wired to thrive, yet we often don't tap into and cultivate that capacity with any level of consciousness. So thriving in is an internal resource that can actually help us if we start to pay attention more to what thriving means to us and put the practices in place that really support us to thrive, we become better at meeting our demands, learning, growing, evolve, evolving, and having more vibrant lives in the middle of this age of complexity. So I wanna pause for one second and ask you to put in chat, what does thriving mean to you? Just a couple of words, maybe a word pops to mind, or maybe you have a sentence. What does thriving mean to you? And Joyce, I'm gonna ask you to tell me what you're seeing in chat. Okay. Or uh, thriving is meeting our demands and in other increased demands. Joyful and productive. Being me and sharing my knowledge and skills. Beautiful. A happy balance in my life. What else are you seeing? Um, thriving, which might look very differently. Um, based on what I've seen so far. Well, those are those are great. We, I, you know, I know many of you like me have been working with leaders for years, and um, one of the core questions that I always ask when I am doing one-on-one -on -one work or work with teams is, "What does thriving mean to you?" Because I don't want to pre-prescribe what that means. Like I think it's an internal resource, but what does it mean to you? And it's interesting, the words, the similarities across countries that I will get, everything from joy that someone said on this call, inner balance, vibrancy, um, energy, care, compassion, love. I have noticed this year, um, more than any other year, love come up, the energy of love. So um, one of the things that I encourage all of us to do and to consider doing with the, the leaders that we serve is really getting them to tap into what does thriving mean to you? What does that mean to you? And, and then what actions can you take that will really support you continually reconnecting to what thriving means to you? So one of the um, ways that we bring this conversation into our work with leaders and it's what I want to uh, spend a little more time with you today is a framework we built just a couple years ago. So it's a pretty new framework. It's an innovation um, and we call it Be Well, Lead Well Pulse, but it's a framework of the science of well-being. So for years, my work has been about helping leaders at that intersection of stewarding environments where people thrive so that the science and practice of well-being and thriving and bringing it into how they lead, bringing it into their vision, their strategy, their operating models, the culture of the organization. That's really been the intersection of the work and also bringing it into their brands. But what I did not have and I couldn't find was a science-based framework that would, uh, that would enable me to do that. And so a couple of years ago, we built it. And I wanna share it with you all in case it's helpful to you. We use the framework as an online assessment system. We provide feedback reports with it. And then we also provide an interpretation manual that 
um, we bring into developmental experiences with leaders to support them in gaining new awarenesses and developing new skills and mindsets around well-being and leadership. The manual has a close to 100 micro and macro practices that they can actually um, use, uh, you know, actions they can take. And all of it is built now on, again, the tool is pretty new, but now we have a database of close to 1,000 leaders in the tool that um, we can start to compare leaders against, which is, which is wonderful that the database is growing. There are six dimensions in this framework. And think of these dimensions as um, all pointing to the subject of thriving. So the central dimension, as I showed you before, is thriving. And think, and then there are 19 scales under this dimension. And I think of these scales as pathways to thriving, all pathways to this psychological and physical well being. Remembering that when we are really experiencing that level of vibrancy and joy and well-being as you all described we are we're wiser we that i mean to me that's the point it's not the point is not just well-being it's wisdom it's how do we show up with greater wisdom and a, a more a larger aperture to deal with these complexities and demands that we face in our lives and work so in the thriving dimension there are three scales one is today and tomorrow flourishing and then resilience. Today and tomorrow is asking, um, what's your state of well-being today? And what do you believe it will be? Do you, how optimistic are you about your well-being in the next five years? So it's really looking at well-being today and optimism. Because we know optimism, if I believe in the next five years, life is, I'm going to have great joy and fulfillment, etc. that contributes to my well-being today. The flourishing scale is a macro scale that's looking at your sense of um, social relationships, your sense of feeling of um, respect, your sense of giving, contributing to the happiness of others, your sense that you have meaning in life. So it's a scale that's got a number of questions in it, but all, again, an overarching metric. And then resilience is looking at the extent to which you when setbacks occur, and they do occur for every single one of us, illnesses, deaths, loss, um, suffering, when that occurs, and it does, um, to what extent are you able to restore yourself back to a place of well being? Resilience is not about endurance. So I had a great conversation with, with someone yesterday, a client, <coughs> pardon me, who said, well, I can continue to endure. I'm, I'm enduring well. It's like, well, I'm not asking you if you're enduring this, the, the, this complexity that we're dealing with and stress. I'm asking you, are you resilient? Do you feel like you're coming now from a place of well-being, ability to bounce back? The second dimension is fuel. And fuel, for most of us on this call, who are um, familiar with a kind of a, the a wellness model, this will, be, this will feel really comfortable to you. Eating is fuel, moving is fuel, resting is fuel, breathing is fuel. Some things that, so these are traditionally wellness behaviors. Some things I wanna point out here, especially from what we're finding and using the tool now in the middle of all of our unrest and, and the pandemic is resting is fuel. People, um, we have a high incidence right now of not getting enough sleep rest. So that's something to really pay attention to and to ask uh, the leaders you're working with. Are they getting enough sleep and rest? Um, are they moving throughout their day? We're all spending so much time on Zoom. So are we, are we moving? Are we getting away from the computer? Doesn't have to be um, a big physical, like go for a run. It can be that, but it doesn't have to be. Just the physical act of moving allows us to feel more refreshed and bring a more creative perspective back to work. And then breath is probably one of my favorite um, uh, psychometrics we have in this whole tool because we come into this world with an inspiration. We leave this world with an expiration and our exhalation. And every moment of our life, breath is a tool we have to use to help us manage our stress, our energy, and our, our performance and our sense of well-being. 
The next dimension is flow. And what we measure here is engagement at work. So that sense of do I, not only am I absorbed in work, but do I gain energy from my work? And when I'm not gaining energy from my work, when I feel like um, I'm not in flow, do I also know how to take breaks and come back to work with a greater sense of engagement? Self-esteem at work, do I feel like I have a sense of meaning and worthwhileness at work? And then mindfulness is the third metric. So two of these that I'll, I'll stress that, that are coming up a lot now as we use this tool, self-esteem at work as people are furloughed, as people are, um, jobs are very unclear. So for not only for, the, for maybe the employee who is affected, but for the leader who might be implementing some of those decisions, it's people are taking a real knock to their self-esteem and this feeling of, um, do I matter here? And so that's something to kind of support leaders in taking a look at for themselves and their employees. And then the mindfulness metric, my sense is the, the extent to which we know how to be present in the moment. And I'm, say, I'm speaking to you all, but I'm also speaking to myself. Believe me, I'm on this journey as much as anybody else. The extent to which we are able to be present in the moment is the extent to which we are less apt to con catastrophize about the future or bring our past into the present moment. So, it's, so mindfulness is really a be, about being present without judgment and with compassion. Wonder is the fourth dimension. Um, it's probably my favorite dimension of all right now because I see it as almost an antidote to this age of anxiety. Our ability to shift into appreciation and gratitude, our ability to see perspectives and lean into perspectives that are different than our own, our ability to look, use this time we're in, for instance, to use the pandemic itself to ask, what is it enabling me to learn and grow? These are all such ex expansive, expansive qualities that I, and important shifts that we can be helping to people to make. The fifth dimension is wisdom and wisdom I see as um, kind of the meaning making frame that helps guide our decisions and actions. So three psychometrics that we measure in this dimension are vision and purpose. So what is the extent to which I have a clear vision and purpose that guides my life and work? I can already tell you that if someone has a clear vision and purpose to guide their life and work and they use it regularly, they will score higher in almost every other factor of well-being. It's that important. Wholeness is the extent to which even in the middle of polarities and conflicts, I feel a sense of personal integration. So I don't feel a separation between um, you know, my challenges here and my challenges there. And I don't create a separation within myself. I feel a sense of wholeness and it befriending sort of the, the light and the dark of things without judging either. And then emotional capacity is our ability to bring a sense of lightness and humor and play, as well as to tune into the emotions of others. So this is our wisdom dimension. And then the last one I'll talk about, let me make sure I'm doing okay on time here. The last one I'll talk about is thriving amplified. And this tool would not be complete because it's a leadership tool. It's not just about being well, it's about leading well, leading from a place of well being. So, Thriving Amplified says my role as a leader is to show up in such a way that I am an active invitation to the well being of others. And that means by virtue of me, you, or the leaders you serve um, being a part of a team meeting, for instance. You are an active invitation to energize others, maximize their potential, and cultivate an environment of care and collaboration. So that is our dimension of thriving amplified. So again, you can think of these six dimensions um, or the 19 pathways as pathways in, all in to psychological and physical well-being. So before um, I move to any questions, I, I wanted to, Joyce asked me to talk about you know, what are some practices that we can do? 
And so I want to just spend a minute on these because I think they are just places to start. Um, number one is to start with ourselves. Your thriving absolutely matters. I mean, all these things that I've discussed that, that I've talked about with kind of leaders you're serving, um, you and I, we are, we are leaders. We are well-being leaders and our ability to be on the journey. It's not about um, having, being perfectly in balance every moment of the day. At least I hope it isn't, or I am, I, I'm flawed. <laughs> I'm not doing that well. It's about being on the journey. Are we committed to taking care of our own selves, mind, body, spirit relationships in such a way that we can now have the energy, have the insight, have the wisdom that really supports the journey of others. So number one, start with ourselves, start with you. Number two is to invite leaders that you're supporting to explore what thriving means to them. That simple practice that we did earlier together, um, you can do with them. You, you don't need a tool like this. You don't need all these dimensions to just ask a question. Um, what does thriving mean to you right now? So not what does it mean to you sometime after the pandemic, not deferred. What does it mean to you right now? And what actions could you take to role model to not only support yourself, but to role model well-being. Because as a leader, we know from research that 70% of an employee's experience is related to their relationship with their leader, what they're seeing of their leader, what they're com what's communicated by their leader, and the relationship they hold with their leader. So everything that leader does matters. The third, um, what you can do would be to create well-being communities for learning and practice. So some organizations we're working with are doing a brilliant job at um, creating circles of employees. You can create circles of leaders who are there just to talk about how they're doing, not to work, just to talk about how they're doing, just to talk about the practices of self-care that they're putting in place, just to talk about um, ways that they are resilient and how can they bring their resilience in to dealing with the challenges, the work-life challenges and all they're having now. So those kinds of communities, creating communities through well-being conversations can be incredibly powerful. And then fourth would be to integrate micro practices for thriving into the work culture of teams and at home. And what I mean by this is for instance, those three sides that we did at the beginning um, the, of this presentation, little practices like that at the start of a team meeting, um, at a place where teams come to an impasse, at a family dinner, practices that help us physiologically change our state or shift us into a state of inner balance and well being so that we can all show up better for each other are wonderful enablers right now, not only for our personal well-being, but for our collective well-being. And um, those, are, those are the four practices. I'm wondering if any questions have showed up, Joyce, that anyone would like me to either go deeper into or to answer, or any comments. And Joyce, if you're speaking, I'm not hearing you. Hello, uh, this is uh, Miss San. Uh, there's no comments or questions at this time, just on behalf of Joyce. Okay, awesome. Well, since we're, since we're finishing up, I'll just say to the group, that um, we, are, we are about to do a certification program to support people in bringing this assessment system into their work. And um, we've saved two spots for anyone in the Global Workplace Wellness Summit Network. Um, say, contact me if you're interested. We're gonna give a 15% discount that's bigger than we normally provide to two people that are interested from this network to be a part of that. 
So just contact me directly. My email is at the bottom of the screen. And I appreciate your um, attention and your time, and I hope this served you in, in some way. Ask you, what is a common question you get asked by people in the audience when uh, you give this presentation? So very well put together. Say that again, Joyce. What is the common question you get asked by people when they see the work that you've done? Um, many people want to know how to bring the tool into their work. And so that's our certification program. So that's why I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm excited that, you know, we're going to, we just started the certification program and, and we now are building a network of people who see themselves as, as well-being leaders. So that's exciting. Um, Kathy asked, just ask where we're located. Yes. Um, we are located, I'm looking at chat now, I can see it now. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see it with all the, everything else going on. Um, right. Kathy, we're Wisdom Works. My company is located in Colorado. Um, the people that um, work for Wisdom Works, either employees or contractors, are located all over. And our work ends up being all over the world. It really just depends on um, Wait, you know, who, who's asking, who's calling for the work? Mm -hmm. um, so she, there's the next question. If thriving is meeting our demands, and if we are under increased demands being in the midst of a pandemic, do we need to adjust our concept of success or thriving? That's an interesting one. That's a really interesting question, Judith. I, um, It's interesting because we just did some really good research. We were looking at these 19 psychometrics, the six dimensions and ethnicity. And so um, I won't go into what we found with the ethnicity piece, unless you guys want to, but what we did find are people that um, felt like they were, had dealt with great challenge, discrimination, microaggressions through their lives and did that in a way that they didn't lower their definition of thriving and they had a support, they put a support system in place, um, were today, this, you know, in their past, were today more effective as leaders and had a more integrated definition of well being as part of how they led. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say it's not about adjusting your definition of thriving. Um, it, but it is about, it, it, you may look at, or you may support other people in looking at um, adjusting our definition of success. So what often is happening for people right now is we have been coupling well-being and success. As, as I've got, for those of you who, who aren't seeing me and are just listening, I've got two circles, one circle created with each hand and I've got them coupled together. And right now what's happening is we're starting to go, wait a minute, maybe what I thought was success in life, usually these are outer things like um, acquiring something, acquiring a certain level of wealth, a status, whatever that is. I thought that was thriving and now I'm finding that thriving well-being is internal, is an internal state of being regardless of what's happening in the outer world. So I believe that's the opportunity we have is to start to decouple our definition of thriving and success. That's a really great idea, yes. Uh, changing, changing the meaning and changing mindset because that's what we're all about this, this, this summit. We're really thinking about how do we change our mindset around well-being so that we can be more successful and build the competencies that we need to. So she said, I have a much lower expectation of myself right now. Well, and the other thing I would add to what you just said, Joyce, is when we start to uncouple, if we start to uncouple um, what I'm doing in the world and my sense of being, so my well-being, remember well-being has the word being in it. This mm -hmm. is about being. When we start to uncouple those, often what will show up is unex paths we did not expect that are supporting our success, but that could not show up because we had our well being and our well doing so coupled together. So 
that is just a thought and it's 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 a thought it, you know that shit when you you reminded me of that Joyce with the shift in mindset I'm even noticing in my own life right now because things have changed completely I'm used to traveling and being in client sites everything's changed I'm on zoom all the time like everybody else mm -hmm. and I'm having to really go wait a minute what is what do I believe success is for me today that's the different question than am I thriving and what can really support my well-being and how can I show up no matter what's happening in a place as a as an invitation to the well-being of others that is so powerful and and I think those of us in leadership roles and who are teaching and supporting others in leaders uh, we have to we have to recognize because things happen in our own lives but can what can we teach from it and how can we uh, be a support for those who were maybe going through similar things mm -hmm. at, at the time. And I know we talked earlier about, I had gone through, my mom had passed away. You were going through uh, also issues in your family as well and recognize, but we still need to show up. right? And we still need to be well for those we lead. It's just the reality. And I, I think, um, I, I so agree with you. And I think right now, um, our ability to a, a dimension of well-being that's kind of underneath some of these dimensions, but I didn't call out, so I'll call it now. Our ability to to use empathy to really shift into empathy um, right now is is as critical as it's ever been. Yeah. We are we are in many systems and structures and mindsets that would call us to become us and them. That would call us to divide. And, and yet, when if you go deeper than that, we, I, I, here's where I go, my belief system, we're all human beings, creative, resourceful, whole. So how do we talk from there? And that is a place of empathy. Um, not only empathy like I hear you, empathy I, like I feel you, but also empathy like I, I want to support you in the way that I can effectively support you using whatever my gifts are. So um, I think that shift, when it comes from a leadership, leading well-being, that is probably one of the most important shifts. And it goes to the leaders who, who say, well, I don't get support from my top leadership, so why should I lead? Why should anyone expect me to give what I'm not getting? So how do you speak to those leaders, Rainy? Do you want to spend a, a minute or two on that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I've heard that as well. Like, I'm not getting it, so why should I give it? Which is a, is a um, I have a lot of compassion for that because right now, as we talked about, people are feeling very isolated and lonely and leaders are people. So let's, we're, we're human beings first before we're leaders. So we're also experiencing this. Um, I would, after listening to that, ask the leader, um, how they want to show up as a leader. Like, what does it mean for them to lead? And what does it mean for them to thrive as a leader? Like, when you go back to some of those questions and what their vision and purpose is, um, often as a leader, as any of us start to see, start to really take a step back and, and, and um, outpicture how we want to be, then we realize you don't need necessarily that external to support to show up as you want. And then, and then to ask after that, what support do I need to make requests of? Because it could be that the leader, their leader is also dealing with stress, anxiety, isolation, et cetera. So we are all in this. This is, this is the thing that's getting me that is so different. I've been doing this kind of work for 30 something years. It's so different now is we are collectively around the world going through a shared experience. We've never done this before. We've never done this before. So now it's time for us to realize that regardless of a level of leader or where an employee is in an organization or where someone is, you know, if you, if you go to a restaurant, the person that's working, the whoever, we are all going through some level of struggle and challenge and change. Yes. We're back to empathy. <laughs> We're back to empathy and compassion and how important those are. Yes, so, so important. And definitely. definitely. I'm having an echo all of a sudden. Uh, 
uh, definitely important for us to, uh, to pay attention to. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, we just love, let's give Renee a hand. <laughs> we just love uh, this uh, opportunity to, uh, to have you share with us here at the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. And um, definitely, uh, do you have, are you gonna be sending a free handout or anything uh, that we can make available to the audience after? We, we don't have a particular handout, but if anyone um, wants to have a conversation or wants information about the assessment system or the, just the framework to use, mm -hmm. just email me. And okay. um, I put that email up there, but I'll say it again. It's Renee, R-E-N-E-E, -E, at wisdom, W-I-S-D-O-M, hyphen works, W-O-R-K-S dot com. And I am, um, I'm, I'm happy to connect with any of you. All right. Thank you so much, Renny. Have Thank a wonderful you. rest of the summit. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, everyone. That was a great presentation. I hope you are ready to get up and have a deep breath and let that information sit in with you as we get ready for our next presentation. So this is a little uh, break time. We're back in five minutes with you, um, Anna Billion, and Anna is going to be uh, sharing with us. So we're back at 1045. So if you wanna take a quick um, uh, break, we will uh, we'll have you back in five minutes. Hi, Anna. Hi, hello. <laughs> oh, good. Good to yeah, see you. So these are some great sessions this morning. So oh, I. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I couldn't listen to the first keynote. I kind of listened on the side. But it was so great, but I it was still my working time here in Europe and I need to get some done, but it was really amazing. I, I enjoyed it. It was really you can catch great. it on YouTube. You can catch it on the YouTube channel. I will. I will really listen because there were some great, um, great points there, and then the whole, the whole atmosphere. So thank you for organizing this. It's a yeah. We've had nothing but amazing speakers for the past four days. I am just so thrilled. Yes, and we're looking forward to your presentation. So I'm going to come back and introduce you. Okay. So I, uh, I had prepared some slides, but I decided that I, I am not going to share them because they were actually more of a guidance for me. And I hope that this can be then more um, a discussion than really okay. just a presentation okay. from my side. Okay, so what do you need from us? So I actually don't, don't need anything actually. Okay, all right. So I just wanted to ask you, um, do you, do you suggest that I wanted to interact with the audience maybe after each point that I make and to ask some to ask them to put something into chat yeah. but I, I don't know how many people are really in front of their desktops you know or they're just listening on their phone so but we, we can get a feeling maybe with the first yeah, question we've and then chat we can... this morning we've used charge um, it chat has been a really great way to communicate with the audience so far so, okay. so yeah so yeah you can do that yeah You're looking great, Anna. I'm just trying to see so that it's not too confusing with all these books and with the, so I'm trying to move so that it, oh, that's okay. it's yes. more pleasant for people to watch. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a nice backdrop. There's some contrast and instead of just having a plain wall, it's nice to <laughs> 
this is my corner where I have some quiet time and my, my husband is out with a little one. So they uh, made sure I don't get interrupted. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> it's Friday evening here, so this is now the time after work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. All right, everyone, I want to welcome you back, and hopefully, you got up and you move your butt and you know, your arms and everything like that. And um, and you're all energized and ready for Anna's presentation. You know, all that sitting, remember? The blood flows, sits in the or water, right? 90% water. And that blood sits in the, in the hips, so we want to move it around. All right, help me as a welcome, Anna. Anna Billion is a leadership development manager at the global professional services firm of EY, which, is, which used to be instant um, Ernest Young. She's also the founder of Great Career Studios, an online career platform of leadership, look, of leaders looking to leave a mark on and create a career they love. In the past decade, Anna has been leading numerous programs in the area of human resources development, helping executives and high potential professionals step into more prominent roles. She is the co-author of the top Amazon bestseller, Inspired by the Passion Test. Anna, welcome to the Global Workless Wellness Summit. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, Joyce. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And thank you for organizing uh, this summit. This is uh, very much needed these days. It's always needed, but in 2020, it's something that we really can't get enough of. <laughs> oh, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so yeah, hello everyone in the audience. I am Anna Billion, and if you're wondering where this accent of mine come from, comes from, I live in Germany at the moment, but I was born in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and um, Bosnia used to be part of um, ex-Yugoslavia. So if you are old enough to remember what a CD is, then you might remember that in the 90s you saw Yugoslavia in the news a lot. And um, that's because we had a long civil war uh, going on back then. And it actually, uh, it had lasted for four years. And so, Today, I say it was our version of what we today call these um, uncertain times. Only that lockdown back then, it looked a little bit scarier than it is today. Uh, because, you know, I remember during bomb attacks, uh, it meant sharing a tiny shelter with uh, as many people as they could uh, possibly fit in. And so back then, I can tell you that everybody could have appreciated a little bit of social distancing. And um, I am sharing this personal story with you because uh, th this experience, this particular uh, life experience has really shaped the way I uh, view life. And it actually also has um, shaped the course of my career because I really got interested in human behavior, you know, and um, I set out to find out why do people do these things and how can they possibly do all these horrible things. And uh, now finding myself in a lockdown again, you know, I feel for the second time in my life that in some way my freedom has been taken away from me. And so I was reflecting a lot how this whole pandemic is impacting me and also how it's impacting the people I work with, because I work in leadership development and I work with leaders and with teams. And I see that uh, um, we are all changing. So we have changed and we are still in this transformation process where we don't know, you know, what's coming next and we don't always know how to deal with it. So for me personally, what was so challenging and it still is about this pandemic is 
you know, during the war, when people live on edge, what they do is when times are really difficult, they come together and they help each other out. So they bond much more than they would do in a normal life setting. And during the pandemic, now it's like, you know, we help each other out if we stay away from each other. And that is so counterintuitive. And I'd say I'm a really positive person by nature. And I think it's because of this childhood experience that I've had, you know, whenever something bad happens, I think to myself, okay, this is horrible, but it's not as b bad as walking under the rain of bombs. But still this pandemic, it really gives me challenges. And uh, um, even though I try to reframe, you know, my thinking and to really remain on the positive side, I still find myself that I have um, days that uh, are um, really tough um, to deal with because of all this um, social isolation. And so, you know, I'm aware of that. And so personally, I was looking for ways to really protect my mental health and also um, to help my team at work do the same and to help the leaders at work you know, help their teams uh, um, take care of their well-being. And um, what I found out, so for me personally, what works best is uh, when I consciously seek out the state of flow. And we heard about a flow already in the keynote session that was so, so profound. And uh, for me, why I say this is the most important thing for me right now is because ever since I got introduced to the work of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, I think this is how you pronounce his name, who wrote a whole book on this topic, you know, it, it, it kind of changed the way I uh, view success and happiness because how he explains flow that this is this state of mind where we are completely Im immersed in an activity and we completely forget about the outside world so everything is on hold and we are just in it and we are so present and we are challenged by something but not so much that we feel under pressure but that we enjoy it and what's so beautiful about this state is that in this state our ego falls away so, you know, I'm a writer besides being a leadership consultant. I write for my blog, Great Career Studios, and I also write for um, Brains Magazine and a few other media outlets. And so whenever I feel uh, the pressure to deliver a great article, that's when I'm not writing a great article because, you know, I want people or editors or the readers to say, oh, wow, this is so good. And this is typically when my creativity really shuts down. But if I am inspired by something and then I just sit down either to process my thoughts or I, or I think to myself, oh my God, somebody really could benefit from this. This is actually when I get the best feedback for my work. And uh, the tricky thing is that flow can't be forced. So we can't just, you know, sit down and say, oh, let me now be in the zone for a moment. It's not how it works. It's rather that we have to have an environment that helps us get into that state. And this is what this session is all about. What I would like to share with you is um, what are my experiences from the workplace and also my personal experiences on how we can create that environment possibly, or maybe even on daily basis, or at least as much as possible so that uh, um, people at work can access that state uh, um, um, more often. And what I found is that actually, if we as leaders and as HR professionals, if we want to create this kind of environment for our people, you know, so we have to be the first ones who are checking in on ourselves. And so this would be for me the first step to really help our people remain motivated in this uh, new normal, as we call it, is really to sit down with ourselves, you know, and uh, to think about these days, 
how much do I love my work? Uh, how much do I love working here, interacting with these people on Zoom and not in person any longer? And um, how is this pandemic actually affecting me? You know, usually when I facilitate leadership workshops, um, what often comes up as a question from leaders is uh, how they can inspire their people, you know, to, to follow the company's vision. So not only to do things because they need to or because that's the strategy of the moment, but because they really um, are inspired by the leadership. And what I think is that there's nothing you can do to inspire others but to be inspired yourself, you know? So you can't mo motivate anybody to do something if you are not motivated yourself. And this is actually where it all starts because you, we can't take, you know, being passionate about our work and being passionate about our people because it's this energy, it, it's really this energy that we bring into our work, this passion that we have inside ourselves that motivates people and it's also the energy that actually generates business in the first place. A um, uh, few weeks ago, actually, I um, interviewed Steve Farber. He is one of the top leadership experts in the world and was also named one of the best business speakers out there. And he has a, a new book that's called uh, Love is uh, Just Damn Good Business. It's also a great title of the book. And um, so I sat down with Steve to talk about um, his book and about his work because he writes a lot about love in the workplace. And usually we don't use the word love in the context of business. And so what he said was so profound, you know, he said, you know, in business, of course, it all starts with a customer because the customer has to love the work you do. They have to love your product or service because if they don't, they probably can get that same thing, your offer somewhere else, maybe even for less money. But if they really love you and if they love the impact that your product or service has on their life, this is where actually everything changes because this is when they come back to do business with you. And your people at work can't create that experience for the customer if they don't love working here. And then me as a leader, I can't create that experience for my employees if I don't love my career, if I don't love working here myself. And as Steve says, it becomes personal very quickly. So, so in my opinion, I think it's really, it's really important that especially in these times, um, that are a bit awkward, we really as leaders and HR professionals don't only try to help others, but to really sit down with ourselves, you know, and ask ourselves on a scale on one to 10, how much do I love my work? And then also, you know, when it comes to the pandemic, how do I feel about myself? Do I think I'm mostly positive or do I think I'm mostly complaining? And I don't mean only, you know, to the outside world, but also our inner dialogue. So it, is it more positive or is it more negative? And this brings me then to the second step. And the second step is, you know, once we have checked in with ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, okay, what do my people think about me? Because maybe I think, you know, that I'm all positive and that my people are motivated by my leadership, but who knows how they really feel about uh, um, the whole thing. And um, what uh, uh, psychological studies tell us is that most of us actually don't have uh, uh, an accurate perception of how others see us. So we are usually surprised in the workplace when we get the 360 degree feedback, or, you know, sometimes maybe we sit down with our employee to give them feedback. And then we think the whole day about th this constructive feedback that we can um, give them and how this will uh, improve their work. And then we find out that they are upset or maybe even offended, you know, 
or, or maybe these days, you know, we are checking on our people more often because we might, we, we want to make sure that they feel well. And maybe they are thinking, oh my God, why is she micromanaging me now? You know, like she isn't, she didn't used to call me that often. Why, why is this happening? Maybe she doesn't trust me because I'm working from home all the time. And so we, we have this challenge really, you know, to find out how people really feel. And it's difficult because now when we are working remotely, we even have less opportunities to really interact with people and to read between the lines because we can't always see their facial expression. And even if we talk on Zoom, you know, the nonverbal cues that we get are very limited. So actually what we can do is very simple. And that means, you know, simply asking people for feedback, you know, like how do you, like on a scale of one to 10 again, you know, how do you feel about our collaboration together? And if they say it's a seven, okay, what makes it a seven, you know, and what could we do to make it a 10? And this actually opens a magical experience in the workplace. Um, I attended a neural leadership summit in New York a few years ago, and um, there was an interesting discussion uh, and a presentation by a professor, I believe, from the Columbia University. And they shared that usually, you know, when we sit down with somebody to give them feedback, their brain enters the state of threat. Because when we sit with somebody and they want to give us feedback, you know, we the first thing we think is like, oh, oh, I don't know what's coming now. And so our brain is already preparing for this threat mode. And um, we are preparing ourselves to be defensive. But if we sit down with somebody, you know, and we ask and, and we tell them, hey, can you give me some feedback? Then actually the whole situation reverses. And what we get is trust, you know, from our coworker because now they are giving us feedback. So we are being the role model in this situation, in this conversation. And we are, so we are signalizing, you know, so I am open for feedback and I know that I'm not perfect. And I really value, I really value what you have to say about me and about us working together. And then when the, you know, but then when I want to give them feedback, then it's a whole other situation because now feedback is not a threat any longer, but it's a gift. It's a, it's a conversation based on trust. And I actually created that, that trust because I set out there to ask for feedback first. And we usually don't do this. I, I, in my experience, uh, um, even as HR professionals uh, and leaders, we know that feedback is so important, but most of us avoid it as much as possible, especially if we have to ask for it, because we are all human and uh, um, we fear that we might hear something that we don't want to hear. And so, so I think that um, this uh, um, remote setup that we have right now is really a reminder for all of us to seek out feedback um, proactively and to really make sure that our people see us in the light that we um, want them to see us. And that actually brings me to my, uh, to my third uh, um, step of how we can motivate our people at work. And this is all about shifting our focus from productivity to the emotional and even physical well-being of, um, of our teams. I think this is, uh, th this is really important these days because, you know, the way your people feel about their work mostly depends on how they think of you as a leader. And we all know, know that, but sometimes we think it's an overstatement. But actually Gallup's research shows us that managers account for 70% of the employee's experience at work. And so what we have to do is like really consciously 
try to help our people achieve that well-being at work. So we have this opportunity, but also responsibility as leaders and as HR professionals. So how can you do that? You know, how can we help our people feel uh, well these days? Actually, there is one really simple thing we all can do. And um, I act, it actually made me think about it when I talked to John Gray. I, um, t I interviewed him for an article for Brains Magazine um, two weeks ago. And John Gray is the author of Men Are From Mars, So Women Are From Venus. You probably have heard of that book. It's like the relationship book of all times. But what's interesting is that John also writes about uh, Mars and Venus in the workplace. So he writes about gender intelligence and explores how we um, interact, uh, uh, how men and women interact together in the workplace. So I talked to him um, about that. And there, there are many interesting uh, findings um, that he shared with me. With me. And on many things in the workplace, men and women have different views, but there's one thing where both men and women actually agree upon, and that's that I think it was about 95% of both men and women would like to have a more flexible work schedule. And yet only 15 to 20% of men and women feel that having a flexible work schedule wouldn't jeopardize their career. And so this was the case before the pandemic. He ran a survey of 100,000 men and women. And now with the pandemic, I think that we are even more need of a flexible work schedule. But sometimes people are scared to ask, you know, because many people have lost their jobs and then they also want to support you as a leader because they see that there is so much to be done so maybe you know they don't want to to ask for a day off to take care of, of themselves and this is now the time where we as leaders and hr professionals have to proactively offer this um this kind of um, self-care I remember that I read uh, at the beginning of the pandemic that the CEO of Amplify, Adam Weber, he introduced a four day work week for his people because he said this whole situation is uh, um, too stressful and I need my people to take some time off. Of course, when we are in a big corporation or organization, it's not possible only for one team, you know, to say, okay, we are now going to work four hours a day. But still, what we can do is uh, really offer this possibility to be flexible, to take a day off when somebody needs it, and also to allow our people, you know, to maybe to come in earlier, to take a break during the day, to um, take care of their physical health, maybe to do some fitness, to pick up their kids from school, and then to continue in the evening. So if we give them this um, control over their, their schedule, people are are going to appreciate it and they are going to feel less under pressure. And uh, once we take care of our people's well-being, this is actually where we create the environment where they can trust us. And this is the, the fourth step I think is really important in motivating our people now in the workplace is to offer an environment and culture that are based on trust. So the, the trust in the workplace, that's actually nothing new. We've all heard of it, and but still it's uh, still so much needed because it's not given that it always exists in the workplace. And uh, uh, what I found a great example of how trust can be displayed in the workplace is um, a few months ago, I read an article on uh, Inc.com, and this article was about Dan Price, the CEO of Gravity. And what it said is that in April or, or May, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, he was faced with a choice, either lay off 20% of his employees or go bankrupt because uh, the business was not um, 
performing as well as it used to. And he didn't like neither of these two options. And so what he did is something that's rather unconventional in leadership and that maybe not many leaders do. He sat down with every single employee from his company to ask them for ideas. You know, so he, he was not this big CEO that had to make this tough decision, but he said, hey, I actually don't know the answer. I don't know if I have the best solution. Can you help me out? And what happened is that during this conversation, you know, people appreciate it so much. And they said, you know what, I am actually ready to receive more money in the next months so that everybody can stay. So people voluntarily agreed on a pay cut. And I, I think this is just a great example, you know, that shows us that uh, um, we can build trust with our teams by asking them for help. And we often don't ask for help because we either don't want to appear incompetent or we think that we are bothering someone because they already have so much to do. So we don't want to come with a second request. But actually what research shows us, um, for example, research by Paul Zeks, who is a neuroeconomist, is that when we ask for help, instead of telling our colleagues what to do all the time, the brain produces oxytocin, which is a brain chemicals that, uh, um, that uh, uh, builds trust, trust in humans. And so I think what we can learn from Dan Price and from, from this research is really um, to think about when we can use the group genius of our team and when we can ask for their help to help us uh, um, drive and um, get um, to better decisions. And then another component that I think really can help us all as leaders and um, um, HR uh, professionals is something that I also learned from John Gray. I already mentioned my conversation um, with him earlier, and I mentioned that um, John has surveyed uh, 100,000 men and women in the workplace. And this is one of the most interesting findings for me personally from this survey. This survey is about trust. So what he found out together with his co-author, Barbara Ennis, is that 95% of men and women believe that trust is the foundation of any relationship. But then around 90% of women say that men can earn their trust when they show caring and concern. And 90% of men say that women can earn their trust when they show competence and credibility. Oh, interesting. So that's really interesting. It made me think a lot. I shared it at work at my team, you know, and everybody was like, whoa. Something happened, I wasn't mute. So now, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. And so when we forget about men and women for a moment, you know, and we just extract these two components, caring and concern and competence and credibility. How can we as leaders and HR professionals provide this in the workplace? And when it comes to caring and concern, this is all about listening, you know, are we listening? And I have to ask myself all the time, am I really listening? You know, am I trying to understand what my people are saying between, between the lines? So not only what they are saying, so they are saying, yes, I'm fine, but are they really fine? And then the second thing is, you know, competence and, and credibility. And when I think about it, many people in the workplace and myself as well, you know, we don't like to talk about our own successes a lot because we think it's, we perceive it as selling ourselves and we perceive it as self-promotion. But sometimes 
people want to know, you know, how competent we are, because if we are the leaders or if we are the HR professionals who are showing them the way how to overcome this crisis that we find ourselves in um, right now, they want to know that they are in good hands. It's like when you are on a plane, you know, I mean, uh, we haven't been on a plane for a while this year. But remember when we were flying all over the place, you know, and then you come um, and then you experience those turbulences that really make you go like, oh, oh, what's happening now? In that case, you don't want your pilot, you know, to be humble and to say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, I really don't know what is is and, and, and I hope we can make it. So I, I'm not really sure if I'm the, the right person to do this, but I'll try my best. No, you want him to say, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the best pilot in this crew, you know, and I can assure you, I, I will bring you to your destination safely. And at that moment, you don't see that as self-promotion. You think like, oh, thank you, God, he is the best pilot in his crew. And this is just a reminder, you know, that trust is built on both, on, on being humble and showing sharing, uh, caring and concern, but also on communicating to people that we are competent and, uh, and showing them the direction and the way um, when they need so. And uh, so, and then the fifth step uh, uh, would be, you know, how can we motivate our people at the workplace? So the, the, the fifth step would be to tap into our people's creativity. I think this is so important because this year kind of was a creativity killer for all of us because in, in, at the beginning of the session, we talked about flow, you know, that flow emerges when we don't feel pressure, when we, um, when we feel in the zone and when we are happy about the work that we are doing. But today in the workplace, we are either under time pressure or uh, uh, we want to deliver good work and then we on top we have all these family commitments that we have uh, um, to balance with our remote work and um, so there has been an interesting uh, study that uh, was released by Microsoft in July and they actually studied how this whole remote work impacts us as human beings basically what they did is they uh, measured the performance of um, 13 couples so they paired people of two and then they uh, they measured how they they observed how they collaborate in person and how they collaborate when they work remotely and what they found out is that those brainwave markers that are associated with overwork and with stress are much higher when we work together remotely than when we work together in person. So what they also found is that um, when we are in meetings, like on Zoom, those same brainwave markers associated with stress are higher than when we are doing non-meeting work, like writing emails. And uh, and how we live today is so we do everything we can, you know, to feel more stress. We are constantly on Zoom meetings and we are working constantly um, uh, online remotely. And so these are all the things, you know, that somehow uh, in inhibit flow and actually shut down our creativity. And so I've been asking myself, so how, what can I do, you know, when I collaborate with my team and then how can I help leaders help their people um, get to that place where they have creativity left, even though they cannot meet in person. And what I actually found is these studies help us really understand that we as leaders and HR professionals have to be mindful of how we use our time online. You know, we have to screen all the meetings that we are asking our people to attend. And we have, you know, to tell ourselves, okay, this meeting is not so important. I can cancel that one. And, uh, like what are all the useless meetings where people are participating where they don't need to be participating? And what we can do, you know, we can free up schedule from those meetings and then we can use that time that we have for personal one-to-one check-ins so that we can really 
get to know the other person and to see what their challenges are now that they are working from home. You know, we can maybe find out more about their family life or what they are missing, uh, how life has been lately. And, and then the second thing is, of course, we can make all those meetings shorter. So the same Microsoft uh, um, study found that usually stress begins, you know, to come in a 30 or 40 minute into a meeting and sometimes by default we you know set our meetings for an hour we schedule the meetings that should last an hour so maybe we can reduce them maybe you know they can last 30 minutes or 40 minutes and then so the, the third thing that we can do is instead of attending or asking people to attend all those meetings that maybe really can be an email free up the time for people to come together and do creative work remotely together um, there uh, has been another study uh, where uh, they uh, did a research on software developers who work remotely. And what they found is that they are much more creative and productive when they work online at the same time than when their collaboration is spaced out. And that's because when we work together on an activity together with somebody, we pay more attention and we feel more appreciated because we know that somebody is paying attention to our work. And then what also happens is that we are able to build on each other's um, ideas and we don't have that opportunity if we are just writing emails to each other. Hey, this is um, what I think. I mean, you know, you can follow up with an email and say, I have this idea, but you are missing out on that instant ideas that are flowing when you are having a creativity session or when you are interacting uh, with somebody uh, in real time. And this is what um, Adam Grant uh, calls burstiness. So he says, you know, that uh, we should uh, uh, work together online together as much as possible so that our so that we allow our ideas to flow freely and that we feel that this um, that the energy is that the our work is just bursting with energy so this would be some way that i found for myself are helpful in reducing stress for myself and also um, for the people that i uh, work with so yeah to wrap up the the, the five things um, that i talked about when it comes to helping our people achieve more well-being and flow in the workplace um, those would be so the first step would be to check in with ourselves to make sure that we are really balanced and um, that we have the right positive ex uh, perspective not 100% of the time, because that's probably not possible. But let's say, let's let's go for 90%. That's good enough. And then the second step would be, you know, to check with our people how they feel about us, because uh, they don't have, um, maybe they, they don't see us as we think that they do. And um, the best way to do that is uh, to ask them directly. And then the third step would be to shift our focus from productivity and uh, um, take care of our team's emotional and physical well-being. And one great way to do that is to give them more control over their working schedule. Then the fourth step would be to create trust. And this is this again starts with us as leaders and HR professionals, you know, to give trust first by asking for help, by showing that we care, by really listening, and also by reminding our people that they are in good hands when they work with us. And then the fifth step is all about enabling our people to be more creative and eliminating uh, all those things that may be in the way of them working creatively. And uh, in practical terms, that can mean really, you know, to be mindful about the meetings that we require them to attend, to reduce those number of meetings, to transform them into one-to-one -one personal check-ins. There can be also short, shorter check-ins, but just to give us, you know, the opportunity to get our people um, better on a personal level and also to allow them to have more time um, to work remotely on concrete um, 
tasks that um, require um, ideas from many sides. They'll appreciate that a lot. And so at the end of this session, I guess the, the key takeaway that I would like um, each of you to take with you is, uh, you know, don't, don't work so much on your team, work on yourself. So thank you so much. Anna, wow, this has been, has been a lot of information. Thank you so much. And such incredibly key points. I love asking for help first. How many of us leaders think, oh, I'll just do it. It's too much trouble right. to ask them. I'll just do it myself, right? And we spend right. so much time uh, trying to do it ourselves and not enough time with our people, encouraging them to do it and sharing uh, tips and tools with them. It's so important to, to do that. I love that because it builds trust and it, uh, it actually opens up communication. It does so much more. I love the flow and creativity, the ability to uh, work with, um, with your, uh, your, your employees to build trust, to answer questions and to uh, work together online. And you know, my team, I work with people remotely all the time. So I, I find it very helpful when we get together instead of all these emails and messages and we just mm. online, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing. And then we go from there. You're very, very correct. Those are some key points. So let's go to the audience now and see what are some of the questions they have for you. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, love the book. Okay. Someone loved the book. You, you want to say the name of the book again that you were sharing, Anna? Uh, so I, you mean the book by Steve Farber or John Gray? Just I can write them both in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they are both great books. I highly recommend them. Yes. And I are some... them too. Yes. <laughs> yes. So just put them in the chat for us. And um, Anna might send a handout or something to you guys. So this way you'll have her contact information. I always like to encourage the audience, the, the speakers to send something, even if it's just the one page that goes in our package to our attendees. So they just have something tactical from you. So I uh, will be sending that off next week. We have a question. We have another comment, very interesting about men and women and how they earn trust. Can you share those details a, a little bit more? How men and women earn trust? Differently? Yeah, I can share. I can share those uh, statistics in the chat. I, uh, okay. yeah. I I'll type them in them after the handout. session. Yeah, can you yeah. Also, send them on a handout to Anna that we can share a handout for those stats. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Thank you. And then the next one, I said, this is such a great opportunity to share. And then uh, what advice do you have for the leader who may say that they are open to feedback, but staff hesitates to give the feedback? What advice do you have for them? Well, I have a leadership development advisor in, in corporations. I've worked with many leaders. And uh, so usually everybody says that they are open to feedback, right? But they don't like receiving um, the feedback first. And uh, and so what, what I actually like to do, to do with these leaders is, you know, sometimes when we are preparing um, the session where they need to get ready for the performance appraisals with their people, you know, um, and, uh, and to discuss how they can do um, that best. I mean, we have all these leadership models that we can share with them, you know, and then we have the feedback guidelines and they all appreciate that. But what I try to do is when I uh, um, realize that somebody, you know, maybe is not that open to feedback is I really try to use this tactic that I mentioned uh, um, in, the, in the talk and that I learned at the Neuro Leadership Summit and it's like I sit together with them, you know, and I ask them to um, give me some feedback, maybe on our cooperation so far or, or on the HR framework, you know, that we just introduced or on the 
uh, performance appraisal sessions um, themselves because they are usually prepared and organized by talent, right, by HR professionals. And uh, and then when they give me that feedback, you know, then I uh, I ask them, so do you mind if I give you some feedback on what I noticed, you know, in the business that you are in, how people feel about certain things? And they are like, right, sure, sure. And they actually don't notice, you know, that I am giving them feedback. And then, and then when I share that feedback, you know, I tell them, look, so actually, you see how this feedback giving and taking went, went smoothly and it's because I asked you for feedback first and then I proposed to give you some feedback but you actually did not even notice that I was giving you feedback because you were not expecting you were not expecting a threat any longer. And even if I was sharing that there was something to be improved, you're like, all right, because you know, I was vulnerable myself. So I opened the space for him to share with me what he thinks is not working that well. And then I tell them, okay, so this is exactly what I think you can do with your people, you know? So when you sit with them to give them feedback, they are going to take it in much better and when you ask them for feedback first. And this is usually something that leaders react very, very positively to in my experience. That makes so much sense. And, and it is such an easy and simple tactic that we can all practice, whether we're giving feedback to our spouse or to our children or as leaders in the workplace, it is a great tactic because when we are vulnerable, we're also uh, opening the door for trust and vulnerability. I love it. Yeah, because our brain, you know, this is so interesting. They showed, showed this at this conference, you know, like we feel that our status is um, attacked when somebody wants to give us feedback, even if we don't know that it's going to be a negative feedback. So, you know, it's like also at home, you know, if my husband tells me, oh, we have to talk. I never assume it's something positive. And so sometimes it really is, you know, but, oh, we have to talk means I did something wrong. And, and, and usually like, then I am on the defensive. I'm like, oh, what happened? And I am not open, you know, to that conversation that actually could emerge if my brain was in the state of reward as opposed to the state of threat. And this is why this uh, is um, such a great tactic uh, in my experience and also backed up by research, like really simple, but it works. It works, it works. So if we understand our brain, we can, our lives can be so much simpler. I love it. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Anna? Ah, that was so much information. It was also relevant and necessary and uh, very, very uh, things that we can apply, tips that we can put. I'm gonna go find those books. They better be on Audible because I don't sit to read, I walk and read. Oh, I'm I'm a reader, so I uh, um, I read them. I actually also published an article yesterday for Brains Magazine on the book of Steve Farber, uh, like uh, on the interview with him. So if you want just a sneak peek on what the whole book is about, you can read the article uh, as well. I'll write the, the link magazine on here. Yes, absolutely. So I, I don't know the, the, the real link to the article, but if you Google this and Steve Farber, so you, you, should, you should get there. And it's, it's new. It, it's been released yesterday. <laughs> send me a link to the article and we'll put it on your, your one pager that you're going to send to the audience. Uh, you, you send for us so we can add to the package. We're sending out to the audience. We'll have the link to your article, your bio, your picture, and the, the, the stats. Uh, I will. I see here another question in the chat, if I might read that one. Yes. It says, at some point, they trust you so much and get so comfortable and friendly that they start to making their own rules for you as a leader. How do you set up boundaries? Thank you. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. So thank you uh, for saying thank you. I think this is a great question. And this is actually also something that I um, discussed uh, in my conversation with Steve Farber, because he came up with this formula on how to define love in the workplace, you know, because just the title of his book is love is just damn good business. And 
and so I was asking him, him, but still, like you work with C-level leaders all the time, and then you come in there and you talk about love, you know, like how do these people react? And so we talked about what love in the workplace means and what it doesn't mean. And what it doesn't mean is that, you know, everybody should be happy and smiling all the time without any format standards. What love at work means is combining uh, um, love with kindness. So uh, uh, combining, sorry, that's what, uh, combining high kindness with high expectations. And this is where you get this mix um, that we call love in the workplace. And that means that as a leader, you know, you uh, can be you can be kind and you still can make tough decisions that are not always popular in the business and so sometimes like he was mentioning you know sometimes leaders even have to let people go because they are not the right person for the job but still they can love them that much to let them go somewhere else where the talent can be used they can do that with kindness and so and anything that we do as leaders that is not popular with our people you know if we have to pull it through we just have to ask ourselves you know what is a kind way to do it because sometimes you have to make a decision you know if the strategy of the organization tells you to do something that maybe the people in your team don't don't want to do i mean that happens happens to me and then um the the the, the mix is really you know to, to to the answer is to find this uh, this balance between uh, um, kindness and challenge for people, you know, where you tell them, okay, like, I know this is challenging and I'm going to challenge you to, uh, to pull this through, even though you maybe don't agree with all these steps, but I'm going to do it in a kind way. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Wow, let's give Anna a big hand. This has been a um, great, great presentation. Thank you so much. You've enriched all minds, and I know I'm a reader, so I'll be I'll be going to I'm a I'm a re audible reader, so I'll be searching <laughs> out those books on Audible. <laughs> and um, and certainly, I love the title of that book. So it makes really great sense in the work we do, because well-being is love for ourselves and love for what we do, and that just makes so much sense. Thank you yeah. so much, Anna. Have a wonderful rest of the summit. And uh, guys, we're going to take our lunch break now. Wow. It is 11.36. And uh, we come back at we come back at 12.30 and, uh, for a presentation with Jonasson. And um, on the power of ethical leadership, right after this presentation this is going to be powerful i am so looking forward to it thank you thank you thank you joyce for organizing this summit it's uh, it, it's such a great experience and thank you everybody for listening <laughs> thank you anna thank you guys all right guys let's take our lunch break and we'll be back sharp uh we're going to start we have a little bit of extra time so we're going to start right at at uh, 12, uh, 1230.